Hello and welcome everyone to the 79th episode of Everyday Channel. With me tonight, as usual, we got our special co-host, <laughs> Callum, Ka Callum Smith. Callum Sorry, Smith. I misprep... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just as we learned in the pre-show, I had been mispronouncing my friend's name forever, basically. But yeah, Callum, yeah. the white death of peace is with it us. Is hey, it is Callum. How's it going? How's it going? Yeah, good, good. Very well, as always. Awesome. And we also got Mr. Matt Pavlik from the Canada, and he's excited to talk about his Enchantresses tonight. Matt, how's Always. it going? I'm doing well now that I can talk about Enchantress. Now that you're free to talk about Enchantress? Exactly. <laughs> and joining us tonight, we got a very special guest who's known for one of the most influential tribal decks in the history of the legacy format, I want to say. He has Treefolk President. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have Mr. Eli, Eli Goings, also known as Goblin Lecky One on Twitch and I guess also Twitter. Hey man, how's it going? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on. Thank you so much for joining us. We we'll have a lot to talk about, uh, especially since we we had some recent goblin spoiled uh, goblin spoiled in the new upcoming M twenty one set that I'm really looking forward to. Yes, because like you know goblins. For for the people that don't know, it used to be a tier one deck. <laughs> I hope I'm not getting any any shit for that for saying it used to be, but it used to be a tier one deck in Legacy, and there's just like so much nostalgia that goes into that deck. So whenever we see it doing well, it's <sighs> I'm people I'm happy usually. For that. I feel like a, if I go to paper events, people are usually rooting for me. Like if if you're a goblins player and you're like, you know, near the top tables, you'll accumulate like a small, a small crowd. You know, just people like, oh, it's go goblins is four zero right now. You know, you have a fan club everywhere you go. Yeah, basically. We we won't tell everyone they pay. I also like that we decided to use the raise hand function in, in our recording software. And as of right now, three out of four people have their hands raised. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> so uh, before, before we get into the deeper topics of the show, I want to thank our new Patreons, my good friend Tom the Decker from Belgium and Aaron Sadler, who joined our Patreon on patreon.com slash everyday channel and who are supporting all the content that we are creating. And I also recently read it all the, the tier so you got like different things, different perks that you can get, uh, speed stickers, maybe t-shirts, the undying laugh of a uh, cast member of your choice. Uh, or like, <laughs> okay, that's, choose that's me, choose me. I'm licking my lips <laughs> as we speak. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Eli's running away. <laughs> Going forward, uh, <laughs> guys, what what has everybody of you been up to, Caleb? What, what what have you been doing? Callum, sorry. Oh my god, I'm gonna kill you for that. No, um, I've been pretty good. I've been even more busy with work recently, so I've been not having as much time as I like to play in the week and stuff. Um, we're getting back to more normal things and business picking up, so that's been kind of it. But on the weekend, I've been doing charity streams for the NAACP which is a um, non-profit organization fighting for lit uh, the um, legal defense and uh, litigation to like find to get racial justice, basically. And so the idea was I would try and get anyone to donate $10 or up, and every time they do, I'll play a donation deck. So it's a really good uh, cause and stuff, and so I've had a lot of donations. So last week I, I streamed for about eight and a half, nine hours, and this weekend just cool. gone, I streamed for another four or five. And so far we've played Shark Still, Dwarf Stompy, Popeye, <laughs> Turtle Still, Oops All Spells, Cat Pact, and then I have like the same amount more nonsense decks to play. So, um, yeah, I'm still trying to like, get through all the donation decks, and they are some really crazy ones. So that's that's what I've been doing over the weekend, which has been really fun. How much money have you raised this far? Like, I, I saw your tweet that you you actually raised quite a lot in, in the yeah. first stream already. So so far, the first stream was five hundred and forty five dollars. Which was really actually way more than wow. I expected, so I was very happy with that. Then in the morning, another friend told me they donated another hundred and fifty dollars, and oh, I've had a wow. few more friends say they've donated further because, you know, just watching me play, they've said, "Yeah, we've got enjoyment out of it," and I wanted to um, donate to, to a good cause anyway. So it's kind of like especially spurred people on into action and stuff. So yeah, really happy to be doing it. That's amazing. You're supporting a good cause, and you're putting dwarfs on the map. On the map is, <laughs> yeah. You could establish yourself as the, the dwarf from what do dwarves have like kings? I guess the dwarven the, king. Wait, yeah. I mean, dwarven recruiter is legal. We we've got to break it somehow. Okay, what does it actually do? It's 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 got been recruited, but for one more mana. But uh, what? Yeah, yeah, but I, I cast it two or three times, and 
twice I just failed to find because they're all so bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're telling me you can stack your entire deck and you, yeah. your best choice uh, was I'd rather draw a random non-dwarf than to stack my entire deck. sad but true. Although I <laughs> once I was going to do more because this deck had Khan, the Great Creator, in, so you can wish for a Goblin Char Belcher and then stack your deck with all the Goblins and then Char Belcher right. them. That's genius. Yeah, that's pretty genius. So shout out to... Patrick Shanner, a friend from London who listens to every podcast and he's he's great. He has some crazy ideas. He is kinder on Twitch and stuff. And uh, this was his idea. I, I messaged so him smart. saying, what on earth is the Goblin Child Belcher for? And he's like, it combos with Recruiter. I was like, wow, that's that's deep. <laughs> Can you get the list for the show notes? You got to send it to me. Yeah, of course. We'll pop them in the show notes, definitely. That's amazing. And and when exactly are you going to stream? Um, do you already know which time? So it kind of depends because I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to do Saturday because people are usually more free on saturday especially these days with the lockdown but this weekend i did sunday and so i'm gonna announce it on twitter when i know so i might be doing some more in the weeks in the in the week in the evenings as well i just i just don't usually have so much time so i'm trying to fit in the best i can so awesome yeah R really looking forward to that definitely and matt which tribe have you been breaking lately none not gonna lie none? no tribes only I've I've just been trying to play, like so I've been playing a lot of pre-modern, and by playing I mean building a lot of decks and playing with no one, and uh, <laughs> that's been extremely fun. Just like pulling out old cards that used to be good in Legacy, being like, oh man, I really want to play Haunting Echoes. Well, I guess I'm building a terrible copy of Trainwreck and putting that together, and oh, I get to play Survival. Well, guess how many Bone Shredders are going in this deck? All of them. So and this sounds great to me as well. It is a wonderful, terrible format. I'm playing Morphling. Like, oh, wow. Like, these are the good times. And it's just, there's just so much nostalgia. Um, Hammer of Bogardin. Um, I actually put together uh, the Kai Bude 1999 Wildfire list, all in German. Oh, that's amazing. Steppenbrand Wildfire. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good time. I'll... Uh, that sounds yeah, so good. So that's what I've been doing. Again, a lot of that. We, we, we mentioned, like, I'd ordered lots of cards for it recently, and they all came, so I've been putting together, like, Tinker Prison and stuff. And I've been trying to just build anything with Master Corrin, I think, because I just want to play that card again. Oh, yeah. But yeah, my, but my, got, my, like, my like, red blue Morphling control deck has Master Cores and Squeeze and Forbids. Yeah. And it's oh, just like, squeeze. oh, it's so fun. I'm down so for fun. that. And also, I had to order a Morphling for, um, for Oath and stuff. How much is Morphling these days? Like, in my head, it's like a five euro card, but it's, it's probably like... It's like just under 10, I think, because it's reserve list. I didn't realize that. So mine costs eight pounds, which... But Korean copies, those are the... That's... Mm, yeah, I can see that being more. There's this weird gap between, like, English unplayed cards are pretty cheap, but then when you go into, like, the collector's market, so Korean or, I guess, Russian or Japanese and stuff, and especially when you go to foils, there's a huge difference in price. Yeah. So, Julian, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been I've been streaming um, a bit again, and I've these days I'm actually trying to make Maverick more playable again. I, I had a pretty decent stream with Elves. I'm also working on that these days, even though I, I kind of hate getting like I, I still got crushed by Garuda, even though it was apparently it's not a part of the format anymore. But you gotta tell that to my opponents because they crushed me with it twice. Yeah, I'm not sure how people. I'm not sure if people play Garuda anymore. You need triple. I know oh, they, they they just go ahead and they play Bird Garuda apparently. So they they cast like a bunch of birds, and that stalls the battlefield because the birds are all like one three, and my one ones can't attack, and then they're forceful and discard and stuff. Oh, I uh, think or not discard, but, I, but you know what I mean. I saw. I think I was watching. I was watching Cyrus Corman Gill play on stream. He was playing some Death in Texas, and he ran into someone with that, and it was like Glint Nest Crane. It was like that's a one three. That's exactly it. None of what? none of these creatures could attack through one. Thing. I haven't heard of this deck at all. Can you tell me more about it? Uh, there was Glintness Crane. It's there good was against elves. Resto. <laughs> um, there was, I mean, the clones like Metamorph and Dax Duplicate. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess seemed, the crane finds LED and like Chromox and Grim Monolith. I mean, it just seemed like a much sl like game one lasted like 20, 25 minutes or something. Like it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> like Jeez. it. it like, I guess it was, it was silly. It was like metamorph copy or revoker to, you know, <laughs> name your sort of fire and ice or something. You know, Ugh. just these horrible, horrible things. <laughs> right, so the, apparently the way the deck works is um, you you cryptic command whatever your opponent is playing. Uh, whenever your opponent is attacking for the win, you tap down all the creatures. 
and then you copy their crowd off beer moth with phantasmal image and then you kill them on your turn so i think that's how the deck is constructed to work it's just like it wow. struggles in the non-elves matchups <laughs> it just makes perfect sense <laughs> yeah i mean why wouldn't you build your deck like that so yeah, that's what I've been doing. And the other thing is, um, there's a green white elves, a green white maverick list that a friend of mine, Marius Hausmann, sent me, and he has been working on trying to make it better against snow. And uh, part of that is he's playing um, what's it called, Field of the Dead, which thus far I haven't really Ooh. gotten to use all that much. But uh, the thing is, like the stupid four, four or five color deck, that just Blood Moon me, and my Field of the Dead doesn't work anymore. But Shadow Spear, that's the other card that he put in there, because it's like more a more versatile, less committed, better skull, I want to say. And it also kind of actually allows you to attack past True Name Nemesis, which came up once. Uh, but yeah, I guess True Name Nemesis is not that big part of the metagame anymore. Of the metagame anymore. But yeah, Shadow Spear, if, if you don't know, it's one to cast, it's two to equip. It gives plus one, plus one trample and lifelink, and that's surprisingly good if you put it on a knight or anything. Uh, so that has been working out uh, decently well, but yeah, it's. I, I'm a little bit of a lost soul right now. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe some deck is eventually going to come along and, and take me by force, and maybe that's going to be goblins. Uh, I, I always used to say, like, I'm the guy who, who, over the course of his legacy quote unquote career, has really played pretty much every deck in the format to like a decent amount except for uh, goblins or you didn't play that much nick fit did you well i said a deck no. <laughs> real decks yeah. <laughs> but yeah um that's that's something that I'm, I'm still missing i almost bought goblins like when i got got into legacy and i bought my first legacy deck i had the entire goblin stack back in was it like 2006 or something in, in my shopping basket online i was like in an internet cafe because our house burned down we didn't have uh, that long story and then my my time like i had like two or one minute left and my time ran out so i couldn't oh, ah. click the, the the buy now button the that things thing that could have been not being a goblin player it's kind of crazy oh, right the things that could have been could have achieved so much greatness but instead you played elves <laughs> what can you do what i also just do? want to really quickly point out that i'm not making fun of nick fit before i love the deck just saying <laughs> well you, yeah. can, you can make fun of nick fit and still like nick fit that's true it's true i mean yeah. it's already a weird spot when you have to explicitly point out that you're not like nobody's gonna say oh i'm not making fun of delva i respect the deck but with nick fit you gotta point it out so that already tells you something about nick oh fit. i always make fun of delva though <laughs> <Double sucks. laughs> uh yeah so we actually we we had one listener question um about enchantress because matt had been mentioning that he's been working on enchantress and matt uh, yeah. the question was about whether you wanted to add help me out nether boy to the deck right already what? did yeah so um i think never nether void is definitely one of those cards that i had definitely considered playing in the tournament last time um it just i didn't really expect it to make the cut um I don't think I ended up running. I ran Humility and Moat instead, I think. Um, but now I think I'd probably move a Nether Void into the main deck and maybe keep another one in the side. Um, obviously, you have Destiny Spinner. You have all these great. Uh, you have all these great spells to cast, and of course the Uncounterable Clause. Sorry, the uh, Counter Clause. You can also bring in uh, Abrupt Decays from the board and uh, have a good time through your own Nether Voids. It's uh, it seems really good, and playing that card, even if you're just playing it on turn four, uh, you're kind of you're just trying to dirtle and lock up the board as much as you can anyway. So I think it's definitely a good card to, to really try. Uh, I think the only thing where it gets a little sticky is if you want to play like Nether Void and then like the Abyss or something else. So then, of course, because they're both, the... both wild enchantments. Ex exactly. So then you just kind of got to watch out. I think playing Nether Void is totally fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that card. I think uh, if you wanted to play Moats, depending on your meta, maybe if you've got more Eldrazi, maybe playing Moat is the better card. Or if you just want to like grind out all those snow control decks, just playing the Abyss uh, is pretty ridiculous as well. Yeah, so. they, they probably have a hard time removing the Abyss in the first place, right? They do, and of course all the creatures just get nuked by it. And uh, So they'd have yeah. to play, uh, they'd have to be playing Assassin's Trophy over Abrupt Decay. Exactly, and and of course, all your guys now have shroud, right? Because you've got uh, you're hopefully uh, laying down a Sterling Grove, and then you're just like, lol, okay, swing at you with my eleven eleven trampling uh, land. <laughs> You should actually mention um, for a quick, quick explanation because that's one of the more obscure rules in, in Magic. Actually, is that there can only ever be one world enchantment on the battlefield, and world enchantment is like a very old thing, and that's 
I, I guess the most prominent example would be uh, was it, would it be Nether Void? It could also be the Abyss. Uh, Concord and Crossroads comes to mind in the Eye of Chaos. And then there's this red thing that everybody buys because it's basically it's a removal spell for world enchantments that it doesn't really do anything, but you can cast it to remove your opponent's world enchantment. And I think that's something that people sometimes use in old school. Yeah, like the old, like it's basically like the old legend rule, right? It's like the newest one coming into play is the one that you, that ends up staying, right? Um, yeah, it's actually the opposite of that rule, right? Because the very old legend rule meant that that only the first one would, would stay forever. But this one, it's right. The, you couldn't, you couldn't the, the youngest cast... one stays. Right, the original legend rule, you couldn't cast, like, like if there was yeah. a legend on the board, you couldn't, nobody could cast another one. Oh, yeah, yeah that's the old, old, <laughs> right. old legend rule. <laughs> legend rule 1.0. Yeah. So, no, I, I definitely think so. So, to sum it up, like, I think if you own another void, I think this is probably one of the few decks you're going to be able to play it in, and I think it'll actually be fine. Um, just casting it honestly or casting it on turn two to lock your opponent out while you build up mana seems perfectly fine because all you're trying to do is sit around until you can either get a large destiny spinner or until you can basically hit something else like the solitary confinement lock or again i've been toying with the idea of going with words of war again because sometimes you have no real way to break through um like a board state and just sitting there kind of doesn't do anything so if you're able to just like cast wild growths and then turn them into damage from behind a solitary confinement seems pretty good sweet and we're going to post your list on in the show notes on its studio in the comments as well. So looking forward to that. For those that awesome. want to play World Enchantments. I wonder what it would take to bring that rule back. World Enchantments? Yeah. I mean, I guess they never... I mean, actually, I was about to say they never really went away, but they did go away. They haven't been made in a very long time, but to be like... I mean, the, 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 those guys just brought back phasing. That's true. It's true. That's, That's point. true. <laughs> That's a very Who fair knows point. what they'll come up with next? Yeah. Because I guess... I don't know. It feels like... Yeah, so if you have a world enchantment play and your opponent plays a new one, it then just nukes it. So they could be pretty powerful, even for like standard. And I don't then, think they would want to incur, like, that doesn't seem like the kind yeah. of thing that Wizards is interested in, like. Well, we're still deep supporting. into the fire world, so. Right. Who knows? Oko should be a world enchantment. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> 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 that can only be one. No, that'd be easier to kill. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in, in speaking of overpowered effects, um, Eli, Goblin. what can you tell us about <laughs> casting Goblin Lucky? Uh, how has casting Goblin Lucky changed your life? And uh, b before we get into that, maybe we should just talk a little bit about yourself and your affection for goblins. Like, how did you start playing Legacy or Magic in the first place? Uh, how did you get into Legacy and what drew you towards goblins? Okay. Um, so I started Magic when I was really, really little. Uh, like, basically how I learned how to read. Uh, I kind of grew up in like a condominium complex and all the kids on the block played magic and they were older than me. I was like the youngest kid. And my brother who's a couple years older than me was learning it from our downstairs neighbor. And I was like three years old or something. And I was like watching them play. And then I remember, I don't, uh, I was probably, I couldn't have been, I was probably like four when my, our downstairs neighbor gave me this mono green, deck from around uh, around odyssey because i remember there was a wild mongrel in it i remember there was cartographer in, for, in it and beast attack those are the cards i remember the most so it was like odyssey era and people were we were all kind of playing casually like and i didn't really touch competitive magic for years and years and years um and so i just played with some friends and then i took a break you know kind of at the beginning of high school because we moved away i didn't really remember just stopped playing there wasn't really anyone playing anymore so i was like uh, around lore one was when i stopped playing and then towards the end of high school, people like started playing like after school and stuff. So I started going through my old cards and, you know, found like an onslaught fetch. That was uh, back when those were like, you know, before the cons printing. I was like, oh, my God, it's a it's a hundred hundred dollar magic card. What the hell? Um, and I got slowly reintroduced to it. And then when I went to college, my uh, guy who became my best friend kind of introduced me to competitive magic because he was a modern player. And he had uh, Birthing Pod and Splinter Twin, and he was introducing me into like the competitive formats. And so I was still kind of like, eh, about it because it was really expensive. And so I had like these kind of high powered casual decks playing against modern decks. So I'd be like, <laughs> I'm playing Soul Ring and Skull Clamp in my, you know, Ninjas deck because they're all cheap. Like you do. Like you do. You know, you, you Skull Clamp your, you know, Mistbind Shinobi, and you draw two cards. It's great. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> but, or, you, but, or you put it on the Ninja of the Deep Hours and then you keep yeah. drawing cards until they kill it and then you draw more. Exactly. So it's like yeah. that against fully powered birthing pod. And some of the games are actually pretty interesting. And, you know, so that's kind of that got me into it even more. And then he told me about uh, Cruel Control and like I started watching SEG streams and, you know, all the all that kind of stuff. And then eventually, you know, we, we both became interested in Legacy and he got into Elves and Storm Smart guy, uh, <laughs> and I, I was still very like budget conscious, and just the idea of buying blue duels was like n- no, 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 no. That's just not. That's just not happening. And I wanted to see what I could do with what I had, and so I looked through all my old old cards, and I had found two Aether Vials, a Goblin Pile Driver, and a Goblin War Chief, and a Siege King Commander, and I think two Gem Pump Incinerators. And that was basically at the start. I watched some old footage of goblins. It seems fun to me and it was pretty budget conscious uh you know not requiring any duels at the time and i just slowly accumulated the cards for the deck over the course of like a year and a half um and then i went to the uk for a year abroad in college and that's kind of when i M- mkm prices got me to get the rest of the deck because a lot of it was way cheaper um and that's when i started like playing for real um at like weekly events in Glasgow. And then uh, I went to Bazaar Mox in Paris in 2016, or is it 20? Yeah, it could have, could have been 2016. There, uh, there was one in Paris 2016. Or was it 2017? I think it's 2017. Um, it was the spring of 2017? No, yeah. the, the one I'm referring to was the was uh, autumn. No, th- this was in the spring, because I remember I went for the spring break. So that was like my first like big legacy event. And I met some of the other like goblins community members there. Cause at that point I was like really active on the source and, uh, you know, always trying to come up with new ideas. You know, I didn't buy into moto, but I was playing a ton on like cockatrice and stuff. So I'd be like, I'd play my weekly and then I had over the course of the week, play a bunch on cockatrice to like test new ideas and try all sorts of things. Like I was trying smugglers copter and goblins. I was trying like all these different splashes, all these different, I just loved exploring the deck because I just found like the card pool went pretty deep and you could do a lot of different things. You could build it a lot of different ways. And I think that's what really appealed to me is that it felt like there was a, a, a puzzle that could never really be solved. And so I never settled on a deck list for more than like a week before I would change it again. Like it, it was really hard for me to, to not like obsessively tinker with it. And I, I, that puzzle part of it has still like remained for me to this day and while i'm more like kind of solidified on my list like i'm more entrenched in my opinions just through kind of exposure i guess that's still a huge part of the appeal of the deck is that there's so much you can do with it uh and so i played i mean long story short i guess i i play like once a year at i go to sgcon for their duels for duels or whatever kind of equivalent event they have uh uh, like in the the summer SCG con i've gone to that twice and then i went to i've gone to like i won a 1k that i played in and that's about it as far as paper play i basically just play on modem now because i mean you know <laughs> the world you're, you're a modem grinder barnacle turd oh don't don't <laughs> say it say it ain't so <laughs> i'm joking i'm joking just really quickly going back to what you were saying about meeting the fellow governments things there was an eternal weekend where actually Julian and I managed to top eight. It was 2017 or 18. That was 17. Right. 17, yeah. I came over with Marcelo. And, you know, I don't know if... Were you there? No. Um, no. I, okay. I only met Marcelo at Paris. And right. I, you're, I'm, I went to London that, like, later that month. But okay. you guys weren't there. I, I just popped into... Um, Dark Sphere was the name yeah, of the shop? Yeah, that, that's our main shop, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I popped in there just to, like, to see what was around, but, like, it wasn't really active at the time, so... No. I was, kind of, I was just kind of wandering around London by myself for a couple of days. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> but th- there was there was one meeting of... Okay, so this eternal weekend we went to, so Marcelo met up with three other of the Goblin Brotherhood, basically. Mm-hmm. And the they all, Goblin they, Brotherhood. They, it's amazing how much you guys are just, like, such close friends. So, I mean, the four of them, Marcelo and the three others, they... 
I mean, obviously shared a hotel together, whatever. One of the guys said Marcelo was invited to his wedding a year later and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you've all met through the source and just talking about goblins for years and years and years. And you've made yeah. such amazing friendships because of this deck. It's that really yeah. The community is really, really strong. Yeah. Um, that that's a, a big part of the appeal for me. Is like I've met a lot of a lot of a lot of people I consider my friends, even though I've met them once or never in real life. Just because yeah. we've spent so much time talking together and like, you know, just, just yeah, just all yeah. about goblins and so obviously you know <laughs> just a lot of goblins. Now we talk about other things sometimes, but like you know, Marcelo. You know, and I know, I know the like London especially has like a really like strong love goblins presence. I can't really properly explain it, but just a lot <laughs> of just, us love it. It's so. just a fact. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. you know, like I, I went to um, you know, this one K I played in, and there were two other goblins players there, and like one of them's like talking to me, and and we got him onto like the Discord channel, and we started chatting, and like. It's it's really cool to to see like how how much enthusiasm there is kind of within the community because I think a lot of people who picked it up have either played it for a really long time and are just kind of keeping with it because it's like their baby it's their deck yeah or it's people who have come in a little more recently and like that aspect that there's all these like people who are really experienced and it has like a the deck the deck has like a story behind it like it has a history it's true. yeah. Like I'm, I'm looking at the deck list that you've posted. That's your like most recent one now, mm -hmm. and I'm picking up the new cards. But there's some really old. I mean, there's half the deck is still really old cards, and you can see every block in it moving its way through history and stuff. It's yeah, yeah. It's gone through a lot of different iterations as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, so well, my my uh, interactions with the community is just, I it, I think it probably is the best. Like all the people are always so friendly. And I think so. I think people aren't like super. Like, we don't have a lot of... Because Goblins was, like, not in a great spot for a long time. So the people who stuck with it are, like, not hyper-competitive, like, super, you know, <laughs> spiky kind of people. Yep, and so there's a sense. there's a feeling of kind of easygoingness and, like, we're doing this to have fun because it's a game. And that's what games are for. Uh, and I don't know. It just, I think it makes the uh, community that much more pleasant. It's just yeah. so cool that you mentioned that and that that all of you guys met because like when I think about it, that's that's a big appeal to I want to say eternal non rotating formats in the first place. That's right. I guess why people love love EDH. They they love legacy vintage, and yeah, it's it's like you, you know you, you don't hear about like the the wilderness reclamation brotherhood of people who <laughs> <Right>. like, <laughs> like you know it's right. people who cast a fairy in standard this is us this is our identity <laughs> that's not happening i guess yeah, yeah it's true it's true no the communities are strong way stronger i love yeah. it so you mentioned you've been playing goblins since when exactly just, just uh, a bit i guess I, idea. I started like having like a, a mostly functional deck in like 20 2016 i would say i mean Maybe that's how it always works with goblins right if you, you get to mostly functional and from there you just keep well playing. it was like i had like two cavern souls three wastelands one rashad and port and i'm like i'm supplementing with like a ghost quarter or two you know and so i didn't have all the all the lands yet that that took it took me a long time to buy the fourth cavern souls because i was just like Ugh. and the fourth <laughs> it feels port. like how how magic kind of was and should be played well at least years ago yeah like you start with what you have and you build up on it it's yeah cool. and, and like the, the the fourth port was really painful because it was at that point right when port was stupid yeah. expensive it was, it was when so ports long. ports were like a hundred bucks or 120 bucks <laughs> and then you're just like what is this fourth port is it worth that much money yeah and like it's sad because i've read i've actually like registered the fourth port like five times tops <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you were to give us a rundown of what goblins actually is in the greater universe that is legacy uh how would you categorize the deck? I'm, I know that a lot of goblin players while i was like still learning legacy i guess you never stopped learning legacy they they told it told me it's a control deck and like to young Julian who who just like looked at Goblin Pile Driver and was scared to be killed on turn three I couldn't wrap my head around that right just like when people to this day still say like for example Death and Texas is, is a control deck that is, is that something you would say about the deck or or how would you characterize the deck uh, I think the the kind of the key distinguishing factor of goblins is that it's capable of playing as any archetype to some extent because the cards are pretty 
varied and it's change it changes roles a lot and that's i think that's what makes it unique and also what makes it really difficult to play is you're going to change roles not just from matchup to matchup but also like within the game itself like from turn to turn and so goblins has a lot of controlling elements right you know it's it's filled with removal spells so against delver i'm very much interested in, in taking a control role you know i'm like i'm gonna try to jump hum generate munitions expert crater maker your stuff and then eventually win the game with like a slang gang lieutenant is my finisher and i'm gonna draw cards with matron and ringleader but against you know and the same thing with like death and taxes you're trying to stop the equipment you're trying to blow their stuff up first like you're not really interested in attacking all that much unless you have like a, a lackey connection you're going to have a huge mana advantage and then the, conventionally I, I think we got to say that we were like the control deck against like older like blue white blue white red miracles because it was thinking like who has inevitability and especially if you had an earwig squad in your deck you had complete con inevitability over miracles because you could take the entreat out of the deck and then they just have almost no way to kill you so you could just play the game at your pace you dictated the pace of the game um and so in a sense they were the beat down because they it was the onus was on them to kill you fast so they had to play like mentor on turn three or force backup and hope you don't have gem palm like that sort of thing things have changed because i think like the, con the conception of grinding in in legacy is almost i don't want to say outdated but it's just like almost a misnomer because the individual cards are often so powerful that like a single card like uro can completely warp the game by itself regardless of what has happened in the prior uh, prior board state so it's not so much about you know grinding incremental advantage anymore it's like who can snowball the other player faster or like more effectively um and so it's hard I, it's making like the conventional models of like what a deck is like i think even harder to uh you know put in a box but I, people do talk a lot about how Goblins is like not an aggro deck. It's a control deck. But I mean, there's certainly matchups like against Four Color Snow. I don't want to take the game super long against Four Color Snow. I I want to I want to kill them really fast because their cards are kind of clunky and they can't block Goblin Pile Driver. So I'm just like protection from blue, protection from blue, hit hit you for seven, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Only seven. Oh yeah, yeah. Seven, seven, <laughs> seven's weak sauce. You're right. Yeah. It's actually kind of scary, right? If you, if you have two pile drivers and they keep attacking and they, all they have is like Baleful Strix and Icefang Codal and Snapcaster Mages, like and you're Uro. never going to block those. <laughs> yeah, and Uro, right? <laughs> like they can attack with their Uro and you can just block it. Yeah. So, so yeah, they can't Elk pile driver, which is a big deal. They can create green blockers with Elks, but then that's what you're spending your missions experts and gem palms on anyway. Um, so it's usually not too hard to clear those. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of off topic. I do think an underrated aspect of goblins is that it has this combo element um and i think this is especially true with the newer printings of uh sling gang and pashik mons sling gang plus pashik mons is basically this two card combo that if you have like four to five goblins in play when you have when you put those two cards in play you just kind of win on the spot and there's no way to stop it um so i'm i've been kind of referring to that as goblins now has tendrils of agony <laughs> you have you have dot ritual as well right yeah, uh, yeah, Skirk Prospector plus Goblin War Chief turns Mog War Marshal into Dark Ritual, where you put in one mana and you get three. Yeah. Um, and that's actually like a really powerful thing. So Goblins has these storm esque lines that are available to it. Um, or m maybe more accurately, I guess, it would be more like elves because of creature combo. But um, the way it generates mana of like using Skirk War Chief, Vile, Lackey has a lot of virtual mana generation. Um, and I think that's, you, an, that's an important part of the deck to realize, which I think a lot of people overlook as well, because it is very much, it's a, a deck that has creatures that attack for the most part. But as you say, there's so many like little key elements and it does rely on synergy. Like I think almost as much as elves or whatever, like, yes, you are often winning by, by attacking, but yeah, like this mana generation is a huge part of why goblins can just like spurt and win in one turn out of almost nowhere sometimes right like like i played a a game versus painter last night and i, I had a pretty hilarious screenshot because of it where they had painter servant and grindstone set up but i think they had like uh a spirit guide in it and then i had a pyrokinesis so it was like this waiting game uh and then i had a war i just had a war chief sitting in play for a while and i had a sling gang in my hand and i top deck a pile driver 
and pile driver is very very good <laughs> when everything is blue <laughs> uh and you know i went from they were at like 17 or 18 and then they were dead like just for it cost me four mana and two cards yeah uh, it's crazy and and totally out of nowhere so like the, those kind of burst kills coming from nothing you can have almost nothing on board but if you have your vials set up especially you can kill from actual nothing on board from a full life total very quickly yeah i guess that, what, what makes the deck so so scary against control decks because control decks are used to sitting back and and handle one thing at a time and maybe two things if they need to but with while and and cavern and a bunch of stuff that goblins has like goblins is, is the ultimate dream of the person who just wants to trade one for one one for one one for one and eventually like all your car cards produce so much card advantage you eventually just overrun them with like one ones and two twos which yeah, yeah, is that's, amazing that's, and that's, that's yeah. the nick for dream almost. <laughs> yeah, right. It's because no, no, you overrun them with four fives. That's the dream. Yeah, I guess nick fit. Yeah, you, you want bigger stuff. But goblins, <laughs> goblins, I like the ideal, the ideal game against like miracles was just like I'm gonna play my Mogwa Marshal on turn two, and I'm gonna play a bunch of other stuff that I'm okay with you killing, and you're gonna have to kill it. And these two War Marshal tokens are just gonna hit you for two, like for the entire game, and then <laughs> that like that's gonna be the main damage dealer. <laughs> Because it's going to feel so bad. There's no, there's no better feeling in Magic to me than someone spending a Swords to Plowshares or like a Terminus on a Mogwa Marshal or a Goblin Matron. Like, <laughs> that is the best. That's actually super interesting. So let's actually talk about Walk War Marshal because that's the card I actually wanted to talk about the most. Mm -hmm. Because when, when the card was printed, and I think it was somewhere around Time Spur or maybe... Yeah, it's from Time Spur. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, okay. <laughs> It was put into goblins for one big, 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 big major reason. Block Tarmogoyf. Like, yeah, exactly. Block Tarmogoyf <laughs> three times. Okay, kind of, or two times, I guess. Mm. Oh, no, three times, right? Yeah, yeah three it, times. Depends, it depends on when they play, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And ever since, like, that's not really a thing anymore, and people also don't cast zombie fishes anymore, I've always been wondering whether those three slots, whether there's anything else that you might want to do with those. Like, you, you just mentioned, like, how it actually interacts with the rest of the deck okay so mogwa marshall um i think uh in the goblins community we kind of refer to it as the glue that holds the deck together um and so the goblins has a lot of abilities that scale uh well with bodies on board and i often say the most valuable resource for goblins is the number of bodies on board that's like the most important factor because your pile drivers are better your experts and gem palms are better your trash master is better your pashik mons is better your sling gang is better and like exponentially so, um, especially with Pile Driver. And so Mog War Marshal, you know, it looks pretty dopey, but it does a couple of really important things in terms of insulating you from spot removal in the early turns. Uh, and like, so Mog War Marshal will really shine against Delver because when you play a turn two Mog War Marshal, uh, and their, you know, their plan is Dreadhorde Arcanist or, you know, had just hit you with flipped Delvers. The thing that you lose to are getting kind of tempoed out or bolted out of your removal spells. So keeping so Mogwa Marshal into Expert kills Arcanist, right? Mogwa Marshal into Gem Palm kills Delver. Mogwa Marshal into Expert kills Delver through a bolt. Uh, and so it, it's the thing that makes your removal spells safe to use for the most part in the early stages of the game. And that is really, really critical, especially when on the draw. So when you're on the draw against Delver, Mogul Marshal is one of your highest priority cards because it's going to allow you to generate the widest board state possible with the least amount of mana. In the unfair matchups, uh, it has its own kind of unfair utility. So against Storm, for example, your primary kind of win conditions are Sling Gang and Trash Master. So Trash Master's an Anthem, it's a 3-3, three, three. and the Shatters, the multiple instant speed Shatters can really come up against, like, especially uh, TES, because it can interrupt double LED lines, it can turn off uh, Metalcraft for Mox Opal, uh, these sorts of things, blow up Wishclaw Talisman. And so if you go turn one Lackey, turn two Trash Master, play Mog War Marshal, you just have three free Shatters on board without really sacrificing your damage output. Because uh, you're still five damage per turn, even if you don't have any, uh, even if you have to use all three shatters. Um, and with Sling Gang, think of Mog War Marshal becomes Lightning Helix, right? It's deal three damage, gain three life. Okay, okay, you, you, you're starting to sell me on the card. I, I was <laughs> like, I always felt like people were just playing it because it's it's been there for such a long time. But you you're really selling it very well. Yeah, so it's it's really critical in um, like making your 
uh, payoffs for your synergy, for your, like, uh, the payoffs for, like, playing the tribe, that much more powerful. Um, and then there's the situation that Callum kind of mentioned earlier with the Skirk, Warchief, War Marshal, allows you to do some stupid things with your mana. So you'll if you have, like, two matrons, you can go, like, matron for Mog War Marshal, sack matron, cast Mog War Marshal, generate three mana, matron for uh, Pile Driver, sack, you know the front half of the war marshals so your board presence doesn't decrease at all cast pile driver swing for like 15 you know or something along those lines that's pretty crazy so you can you can do some pretty crazy things because the thing that goblins get choked on uh the most with war chief is red sources so war marshal generates extra red basically Makes sense. Okay, makes sense. okay. I, okay, I'm going to keep it. You know what? <laughs> Actually, I, I want I want to stream goblins now. I, I it's it's been so long since I've like, I've always admired goblins because the deck always felt so scary to me because of pile driver, like I mentioned earlier. But it's it's actually really kind of cool, and I've always wanted to make an elf stack with wild. That's one of my big big dreams. I mm. want to make wild viable in elves. It's just it happens so that elves already produces a ton of mana. So it's like a little what redundant. Are you really, yeah, but yeah. it's it's ah, oh, especially ever since I played Esper Wild, I mm. I really gotta say I've been playing Legacy since I don't know like fifteen years or something. I never really appreciate appreciated Wild as much as I did over the last couple of weeks, even just. Wild is sweet. Wild is so so fun. Um, like turns out giving creatures flash and uncounterable lets you do some really silly things. It's, it's for one mana, so the card is insane. It's it's a really broken card, so like. To- to be to be fair, I I actually want to say that right now I feel like Vile maybe not right now. Hmm. Back when, when in the period a couple of weeks ago when Snoko was super dominant, I felt like Vile was kind of at its worst as it has been in a while because in uh, my experience playing Goblins, I've always been like either Vile is almost always correct to play first over Goblin Lackey if you have both, but the Snoko meta has made it so that. Lackey is actually better than Vile in a significant enough number of matchups that it's it's kind of close of which one you lead on. I can see that, yeah, because I guess if you play the the Vile, you're like give them a bit more time, and then they can like look at the Vile and then Dead of Winter it away or something well, like that. It, or... Yeah, and it, it's like you know you play the the Vile on turn one, and then turn two they have Ice Fang to block the Lackey, and then they elk the Vile or they Repticate it. But yeah, if you go turn yeah. one Lackey they have to have white source plow, which is not that easy. They can't go turn one astrolabe, which is a huge deal. Because if they go, if you go turn one lackey and they go turn one astrolabe, they are dead. <laughs> yeah, I can actually... It's, it's weird to think that this is like the premier control deck in the format and where you really want to lead with lackey of a vial. It yeah, just, it's very... It's very it was never true before, right? Right, absolutely. You'd Here always comes like, my spiel about the deck not being a control deck in the first place, but keep going. Mm. <laughs> Well, oh, do, uh, snow not being a, a control deck. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think I think we discussed this like briefly before. Okay, it's it's a uh, like mid range deck. I'll give you that one. Yeah, I, I I'd agree with that. But it's it's I think it's probably still the most like controlly ish. That's deck. true. But yeah, of of the good decks, it's definitely the most controlled. I mean, yeah. there's people like there's I guess shark still and stuff like that. That, that that's like really <laughs> control. Yeah. But yeah, f- that's definitely the, the most controlled deck we have in tier one and tier two. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we we're mostly agreeing with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess anything else about goblins? I guess other misconceptions. Uh, I think the the whole like can't ever beat combo thing is a little overstated because I think it's not a matter of can't beat combo. It's you can't beat every combo. Um, it's you have to kind of pick your battles, and so normally I think of like there's there's a couple categories of combo decks, right? There's there's storm-esque deck decks so there's ts and ant obviously but then there's also like you know a- any of those decks that's trying to spam zero mana permanence or you know the, the echo echo the aeons kind of stuff and then there's um sn- uh sneak and show variants where there's blue green omni or actual sneak and show uh and as a general thing you could say the quote-unquote like just Crystal Brand decks, right? You know, uh, Reanimator. <laughs> we call um, them bullshit decks. Yeah, bullshit decks. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, and then uh, <laughs> there's depths, and those are kind of like the main categories of combo. Um, and normally, if you're saying Storm, Crystal Brand, depths are like the three categories, I say you can build your Goblin sideboard to reasonably beat two out of the three, 
and you're just going to have to get really lucky if you run into one of the other ones. And you can you can do things about your cyborg to affect this. So like Cabal Therapy, which I'm playing right now, is the most generic uh, and that it's effective against most of those decks to some extent. Like like before when you're playing Chalice, Chalice is great against Storm, but it's pretty mediocre against Sneak and Show and Depths, right? Um, you can play um, a bunch of Pith and Needles and uh, you know, Caracas and uh, maybe if you want to go as deep as in Snaring Bridge, you'll be decent against Sneak and Show and Depths, but you'll not do well against Storm. So, you know, the, the, the slots are spread out enough that you you can devote... Oh, oh yeah, I guess Graveyard graveyard combo, you have to cons- you consider, like, Dredge. Though Dredge is, like, probably one of our better combo matchups because we have a lot of ways of blowing up Bridge from below just naturally. We um, don't have got, um, Mock Fanatic anymore, but yeah. You, you yeah, oh, my God, I love that Mock was, Fanatic. That used to be the big one. Uh, I, I wrote a whole article on Mog Fanatic back a couple years ago called An Ode to Mog Fanatic because I was really happy with it in my deck for a long time. It's been a little pushed out just like there's not that many X ones in the format anymore, but for a while it was it was awesome. Do you want to mention the uh, unbeatable combo against Grixis Control? Because this is one of my <laughs> favorites ever of, of this deck. Yes, yeah, so um, when Grixis Control was really popular in like 2018, I was getting really sick of losing to him to Turok, snap him to Turok, and then like Colgan's Command and all that. Because goblins, I think it's, it'd be better now because of Sling Gang and Expert handling Planeswalkers and killing fast. But back then, we had trouble deploying to the board uh, quick, quickly without um, Viol or Lackey getting live. And it made him really punishing because you go like turn three Matron for Ringleader and they hit you and hit the Ringleader and like a land, you're just like, ugh. So the... The tech to switch the inevitability back in your favor was Volrath's Stronghold. And I found this... Uh, oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> I found this in some sort of... I don't know. I think a friend suggested it to me in group chat. I was like, all right, got to give this a shot. And I tested Volrath's Stronghold extensively. And I'm still a huge fan of the card of the deck. It's just not as necessary right now. But back with Grixis Control, they could not beat it. Like, you just put Goblin Matron on top of your deck, eventually cast it, then ca- then get Siege Gang Commander. And then you just make the game, I'm going to cast Siege Gang Commander every other turn for the rest of the game, or every turn for the rest of the game if you have an Aether Vial, because you just take it up to five. <laughs> and like they just they could they could Toxic Dailage you three times, they could him your entire hand, they could they could do anything they wanted, didn't matter, I'm going to cast Siege Gang Commander every single turn. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're in a desperate position when you, you're considering bringing in Graveyard Hate against goblins. Oh yeah, people did that. And people brought in Blood Moon against me. Oh yeah, that, that's another one. <laughs> against the mono red deck. Yeah, I, <laughs> at, that, at that point it was it was red black with like three black cards. <laughs> and they'd bring in Blood Moon against me. And I had a game against I had a game where I had I had one red source, my whole hand was like red red and you know, like really co- like stuck on mana sources, and they cast Blood Moon and my entire hand was unlocked. I was like, thank <laughs> God. That's the classic goblin's problem. Like, oh I've got like one red land, three yes. colors. Yeah. And, oh. Okay, okay, so we we got a general idea of how the deck works. So where would would you say the deck is like a solid tier two deck or is it struggling? Because I guess nobody's going to say Goblins is a tier one deck right now, but no, I, think I, I wouldn't is, say that it's either. It's the best. It's looked in years, right? Yes, it has. Um, I think people should not sleep on the fact that Goblins of two years ago is not even close to as good as the Goblins of today. Goblins in the past couple of years has received Goblin Crater Maker, improving all Stoneforge matchups, blowing up Emrakul, making Eldrazi nearly a buy has made death taxes all the opposing vile matchups much better improved delver because it's just another way to shock things crater maker was a huge grab for the deck chain whirler m- made us uh faster at uh beating up other creature decks like Ma- like maverick chain is so good against maverick like you don't untap with it like alvin sharpshooter did and also it's just a super relevant body right three three first strike is bigger than most creatures in legacy Munitions Expert, absolutely huge in basically all matchups. We have a way easier time killing Planeswalkers, bigger creatures like Tarmogoyf. Like, it's much harder to jump home and incinerate a Tarmogoyf than it is to kill one with a Munitions yeah. Expert. Like, way easier. It's crazy how much difference that one damage is. 
and also munitions expert has improved uh pile driver as well right because you can um you're more likely to generate bodies on board faster and also coming off a play off vile and lackey can really matter because you can like sneak lackey and pass their maybe off of vile like they attacked or maybe you're trying to kill a planeswalker you can just lackey in your removal spell for the planeswalker that's really good expert's really good Chain World is really good. Pashik Mons has added a more aristocrats kind of element to the deck. You can punish Wraths. So I've done like Violin Pashik Mons in response to your Dead of Winter, and then the Death Triggers <laughs> killed them. Um, <laughs> I've, oh, man. I've killed them with... Um, uh, you can use it to... It's actually kind of an anti-Plague Engineer card, because if you if you have it on board and they cast Plague Engineer, then the, whatever, ki- whatever the Engineer kills kills the Engineer as well. And if it's just a kind of a neutral board state, you can just start casting your X ones into the Plague Engineer, and that will kill it. Or you can, if you have enough mana, and so if you have a, a Pashlik Mons and then a two two currently a one one, you can activate the ability, sacrifice it, ping their face for one. The two two the two one ones come to play, die immediately, kill the Plague Engineer. Trash Master improved all. I want that in Fs. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that uh, inherently like a green ability? Did, didn't we get like beasting or something back in Alpha or something? Okay, so? like <laughs> maybe. Green <maybe>. has pinging. <laughs> I think red has more pinging than. I think than red green. is more pinging, yeah. <laughs> I mean, probably blue has even more pinging than green, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, if we go right back to, to Prodigal Sorcerer. Yeah, Hermetic Study, Hoshuk, yeah. represent. <laughs> Right, but Trash Master, obviously really good. And like before we were playing, before Trash Master, we were playing Tuck Tuck Scrapper and Tin Street Hogan. Like the, the quality of Shatters has gone up so high. Trash Master is ridiculous. Like you can just blow up your Sword of Fire and Ice, blow up your Aether Vial, blow up your GTA, blow up your Batter Skull all in the same turn, you know? <laughs> like, I, think, I think when this card was it came out, it was the first card I'd ever pre-ordered from my local game store. I always just go in and buy some cards there. This is the first card I emailed them or messaged them on Facebook, whatever, saying, do you have this immediately to buy? I want to play it in Goblins. It's the, the first legacy tournament I can. Yeah, I, I, I believe <laughs> I, I was playing two main deck in, in Goblins until uh, Crater Maker got printed because the card is just so beefy. Um... Also, oh, the other big thing about Creator Maker I forgot to mention is that it blows up Karn the Great Creator, which is really big deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the last pickup is Sling Gang, arguably the most important. Um, Sling Gang has improved every single combo matchup because we can now kill out of combat reliably. So if the opponent's at, like, I don't know, seven or eight and they cast Show and Tell, they might just die. It doesn't matter if they have Omniscience, Grizzlebrand, Embercool, they might just die on the spot. It made Ad Nauseam much scarier to use because if I go Lackey into Sling Gang and then cast a Mogwar Marshal, I have seven points of burn and life gain on the table. So good luck casting that Ad Nauseam. Depths became a lot. Like Depths used to be almost unwinnable. Depths I used to think, like Turbo Depths, I still think is probably the worst matchup for the deck just because the, the good cyber cards are harder to like fit in the broader context of Legacy. Like you have to play multiple Needles, multiple Caracas. Um, which I am doing right and now. Just, you're, you're also not playing the Bounce Goblin anymore. Yeah, Stink Scourger sucks. We we just have better cards than <laughs> Stink Scourger now. Yeah, I guess um, Kratomic is a strict upgrade almost. Yeah, basically. So so yeah, Depths is really tough. But Sling Gang, if you can get Sling Gang into play, you have a decent shot of surviving that Merit Lage, Merit Lage hit, going to one because you gain some life, and then um, cracking back for lethal. So, I mean, Depths is still bad, but Lands I now think is solidly positive. Even, you know... Uh, the sl- slung gang gets around stuff like glacial chasm even though it's not particularly played anymore but i have a really strong uh, record versus lands and i think that's a huge like hugely attributable to slung gang lieutenant dude that's a, that's a, so what's actually keeping goblins from from being the top deck in the format like i, I see you you've you've got like a lot of tinkering going on with goblins when you send us the screenshot of your list it says black red goblins hashtag 23 so, so you've tried a lot of things. That's 23 of like the past, I don't know, six months or something. There, there. I have a big spreadsheet that I keep track of stuff. So I guess like full, I guess full disclosure that my overall win rate since the Ren ban and all like, this is all like Moto Leagues and then like a 1K and then like the occasional pre, I played like two prelims. Um, I'm at like just under 66% match win rate. That's with, already insanely good. With that is five, very, very good. With also. 515 matches played. That's really, really good. Like, that's 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 approaching tier one levels. Or that's almost, that's actually tier one levels. That's tier one. That's I'm going to say that. So I'm I'm really proud of that right now. I've been running a little hot lately. Um, 
So that's been. And going is it on. like proper recording, or is that uh, um, well, not gonna shout out anyone? <laughs> no, no, it's 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 legit. It's like a, okay. a wins a wins a loss a loss. Uh, okay, there was cool. a, there was a short period where I stopped recording because it started to affect my my own play, where I just didn't record anything because it it really like effectively meant mentally, and that really bothered me. So I tried to separate myself from my results more. And surprise, surprise, your results get better when you don't care about them that much. Oh, I, I can attest to that very yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> So I think the, as far as what's holding goblins back, the most problematic matchups are definitely going to be TS is probably my my worst running matchup. I'm like um, six and ten against it. That's like with the worst matchup with like a significant sample size. Yeah, but that doesn't count because that deck is bullshit, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we can go. No, seriously, I love TS. I played it like for a lot of time on, on but it, MTGO. But, but if you but, really want to be yeah. TS, you can. You can play a couple of mind break traps, and that just improves everything immensely because they have a really hard time beating trap ever since they've been cutting on discard spells. Yeah, nice veil of summer. Yeah, nice veil of summer. Exactly. Turbo depths is really tough. I think medium depths is doable. I think there's a couple combo decks that are actively favorable. Um, I think Blue Green Omni is a good matchup. Blue Green Omni is a good matchup. Okay, no, that's steep. I think you're just faster than them. And then the Red Elemental Blasts, uh, the Surgicals, Cabal Therapies are really good. Um, Earwork Squad is really good. So they, they need specifically like Show and Tell, Omniscience, Emrakul, Cunning Wish, because you can blow up the Emrakul most of the time, so they need another payoff, and then most of those Cunning Wish lines either run into Mind Break Trap, or... Uh, ah, okay, okay, so, so so you're basically saying they go Show and Tell, Omniscience, Hardcast, Emrakul, and then, you then kill before it. they yeah. get to attack with it, they, you crowd them make either way. I see, I see. I've seen this That's happen neat. a lot more than you'd think as well. It, it's it's a pretty real thing. Yeah. yeah you've played your fair share of Blue Griamni. Yeah, yeah. And I watch Eli a lot, stream a lot as well, and he he does beat Blue Green Omni quite a lot. Like the the port's also the huge thing, right? Because yeah, they port is don't huge, have yeah. Lotus Petal. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. So if they if you go turn one lackey into port, you're probably racing them um, pretty reliably. Oh, dude, that reminds me so much of the old Goblin decks, like 2005, six when Goblins used to be like part of the trifecta almost. As well as like Landstill, Goblins, High Tide, and I guess then we got Threshold. Like Goblins was dominating the format to the point where people actually played. Do you guys know T Varda's Crusade? Oh yeah, of course, one of my favorite cards. <laughs> I knew that Matt was gonna know the card. <laughs> hey, Destroy in one point five, goblins. when you're playing like Landstill versus Goblins versus this, you need to you need to have your outs. That's fair. That's fair. I, I have a great story about those kinds of old goblin hate cards. Um, when I was leaving Glasgow for my last, it was like my last week uh, uh, of my year abroad, and I had been playing, I had helped like kind of cultivate this legacy scene there because it wasn't really happening until I was like, hey, let's play some legacy. And some people got together and people lended out decks and that sort of thing. Uh, and I was leaving and I was really sad because I had made a lot of bunch of, you know, a whole, whole bunch of friends. And so for the last legacy weekly, Everyone's like, all right, we're all going to pack Cyborg Hate for Eli specifically. <laughs> and so Death and Taxes had Tivit Earth Crusade. All the Delver players had Hydra Blast and like engineered. There's a lot of engineered plagues. Uh, <laughs> the the blue control <laughs> players had Chill. Like you know, everyone had their hate cards. And you crushed uh, them all, I hope. I did. I did get second. Wow. Oh, that's man. so good. Would have been so. Uh, no offense to you, but it would have been amazing if you had gotten destroyed at yeah, the yeah. tournament, yeah. and then you left anyway. But then people would perpetuate the story that you left because of that tournament. And they <laughs> right. you so hard that like you you left the entire continent and yeah, you went yeah. back to the US. Um, I I do have the the very specific memory of beating double engineered plague, but only specifically because. Do any of you know what uh, Grenzo Havoc Razor does? Uh, sorry, Gr Grenzo what? Grenzo Havoc Razor. Shall I try? Is that Go the ahead. one that does stuff from the bottom of the library? No, that's 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 Grenzo, that's Grenzo Dungeon Warden. So it's, it's red red for a 2-2 mm -hmm. legendary creature. Mm -hmm. Then it's like goblins you control have goad. No. No? No. <laughs> Fuck, so wrong already. No, goad's the thing where they may have to block it. But whenever so, the, whenever so a goblin you goad, control... Goad, goad is involved. Goad is, goad is involved. There are okay. two separate abilities. Right, they have goad or something. But then the main thing is... Whenever a goblin you control deals damage to a player, you exile the top card of their library, and until the end of the turn, you can play that card. More or less, yeah. So, so, the, so, so it has two abilities, and they both trigger when any of your creatures connect. Doesn't even have to be a goblin. Okay. So you can either go target creature, meaning in one verse, it's a multiplayer mechanic, but it works in one v one v one, where it's just like um, the the creature has to attack. 
So this can matter against like it's not rare to matter it's it's not common to matter but it can matter against like mother runes where it's like they have to activate at main phase or else they have to attack with their mom or you can go to like a tarmogoy for an angler to attack into like a chump blocker and then you can swing back for more so that that's a, a niche application of it but the other ability is more relevant so it's for each creature that hits um you can choose to exile the top card of the library uh you can cast any of those any spell until end of turn with any mana cost and what happened was I, I love this card. I think it's like weirdly good in a lot of situations. It's like one of my pet cards. You know, it's good against. It's weirdly good against a lot of combo decks because you can hit their discard spells and cast them. Or like I've <laughs> I've used Dark Ritual and Cabal Ritual to um, get a Matron in play early, and then Matron for Earwig Squad and cast it off the rituals. Or like Matron Crack LED for Black Buff Black Cast Earwig Squad. Anyway, there was um, I hit. Basically, he had an Engineered Plague, and I had a, a Grenzo and a Ringleader. I attacked, got two triggers, and one of them was Abrupt Decay. <laughs> and I got to Abrupt Decay the uh, the Engineered Plague, and he eventually played a second one, but and then I I think I won with a, a 4-2 Earwig Squad attacking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's so, insane. Grenzo, Grenzo is such a fun <laughs> card. I feel like, you know, like, I can have so many Grenzo stories. Crop Rotation against Depths for, your, for Caracas when they're going to kill you. Uh, hit uh jace against check pile when that when that was a deck uh oh, dude. I, goblins with <laughs> i cast i so you cast, can go like minus on your ringleader and put it back in i i it was against and then you brainstorm about the goblins and then ringleader into them again yeah. yes it was against check pile <laughs> in day two of sg duel for duels i had just beat dave long on turbo depth so i was like i was like the luckiest goblins player on the planet this was in this was in death right was legal and this is like my big like one big event that I like had a pretty deep run in that I've played in because I'm only played in two. But I uh, I hit Jace with Grenzo, cast it, and then brainstormed into Blood Moon. <laughs> oh, it's so sick! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I love Grenzo. He's such a fun card. But it's not uh, Grenzo's not in the deck right now. No, um, basically he Grenzo kind of comes in and out as a one of when um, Pile Driver is bad. But I think Grenzo slot will probably be eternally taken by this new card that I'm that we'll talk about conspicuously. That we talk, yeah, we we'll actually mm -hmm. get into into the spoilers um pretty soon. Just before we conclude Goblins, which right now is a really 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 solid tier two deck, and if you play it well, like Eli, over I think five over the five hundred matches he said, I mean you, that, you can hit like a really decent win rate. Yeah, so I mean I've been playing obviously a ton. The deck is really hard. It's really punishing. Um. And I don't say that to boost my own ego. I say that because it is deterring to new players. Um, I can totally attest to that. Like like I said, I watch you stream quite a lot. And very often I, like, I'm thinking the lines through as you're going through plays and stuff. I'm thinking, yeah, I think I'll do this here. And I do really try and think about it. And then you're like, no, I'm going to do this. Like the play that I wanted to do is quite good. But because of this, because next turn I want to set up for this, whatever. Like it really is more than a lot of other decks setting up for the next few turns as well. So Yeah, you have to, you have to think many turns in advance. Yeah. Um, and Very hard. it's mana, like sequencing is really difficult because you have all these utility lands and you have to think about like, if I port this turn, I can't mana deny them on the following turn if I want to cast Munitions Expert because then it's a, still just the port up. So I should Wasteland this turn and then Expert next turn. And then, you know... Yeah, I really think it's one of the hardest decks in the format. It's really, really hard. Yeah. And so I've played it for like four years now, and I still make mistakes. Like, I lost a game against Four Color Snow on stream because I ported instead of playing Crater Maker on turn two. And that was the entire game. That That's what cost me the game. Because I ended up being like a few points of sh damage short, and I couldn't attack with my ringleader because there was an Ice Fang Kawaddle. And if that Crater Maker had traded with or blown up the Ice Fang Kawaddle, I would have won the game. Like, small, small things Rough. like that really matter. Yeah, but that's also part of, of the, the appeal of many decks, right? People, exactly. people like that they can solve the puzzle. And that, that's yes. something you mentioned earlier. And that's always something I also feel, especially when you're playing non-blue decks, like all the time. Like you get punished so hard if you screw up because you don't really get to like correct any of your mistakes yeah, you very don't get, easily. There's no bailouts. And sometimes your bailouts don't bail you out because you're like, oh, I got a top deck ringleader and you got a top deck ringleader and you do. And then uh, you like <laughs> hit, you hit like one goblin lucky <laughs> and you just feel so sad. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's it's what a, I it's need a, right it's, now. A, it's a swingy experience sometimes. It can be tilting. Um, the deck does have that real fun factor as well, though. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what keeps ringleader fun, right? Is like, yeah. it, it might be zero, it might be four, you know, and you might be stone dead and you hit, like, four off the top with ringleader and then you can, like, kill your opponent when you were dead on board. Like, yeah. that that experience is the, uh, the, the hype of goblins. Awesome, man. 
so before we move on, there's two things I want to ask. There's actually like one listener question and one Julian question. Let's do let's do the Julian question first because it's stupid. What do you think about Goblin Wizard? Because ever since like I've known Goblins, Ooh. I've wanted to see Goblin Wizard implemented, and it's probably just not good enough. And for those wondering, that's that's a Goblin from Legends. It's no, a it's one from, one from the, for. I think it's from the dark. Yeah, I think it's from the dark. Oh, you're right. You're right. It's from the dark. See, <laughs> uh, that's why we got you on. Uh, it's <laughs> on the reserved list. It's two colorless and two red. One one. You can tap it, and you can put any goblin permanent so you can even put uh what's it called bogadan shenanigans or something into play yep. and you can pay one white and any goblin gains protection from white basically protection from sorts of process i would guess yeah it's that's just too clanky right it's it's i own a goblin wizard i bought a goblin wizard like a really busted up copy just so i owned one uh and i always i'm also tempted to put it in the deck but the the quality of four drops has gotten way too high to actually introduce it. You know, I think if you saw a ton of if the meta if you had a really weird meta game where you had a whole bunch of like stone blade, death and taxes, blue white miracles and esper vial, like if you had like those kinds of decks really popular, then you could maybe justify a goblin wizard because the card is very sick. <laughs> or maybe there's a meta game where Patron of the Aki is really good. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining a world where you get War Chief, and then on the next turn you just pay three for Goblin Wizard and immediately use that to put Ring Leader into play. It's oh, uh, and also a sweet artwork. But yeah, that's it does, yeah. <laughs> that's Goblin Ring Leader. And the second one is our listener question from a friend of mine actually, Philip Landgraf. And I'm just gonna I translated it from German, and it basically comes down to. <clears throat> How the fuck do I beat goblins with A and T? Just got to give up. Matchup's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I, I I was told the the list in question had like chal like a bunch of chalices and mind breaks, right? Chalices, mind breaks, and character therapy. It's basically the guy Ooh. was bringing in 15, 15 cards or something. I mean, I, I don't know. Cages, I, anything. I, I normally board in like twelve cards versus ant, so that's not that unusual like a, like the ant is this is the deck that most of our cyborg cyborg cards are live against like in my current list the only cards i wouldn't board in versus ant are the two pyrokinesis the caracas and uh the pithing needle so everything else comes in turn one kill goblins usually works unless they have mind break trap i mean if you're facing therapy chalice and mind break that's going to be pretty tough to beat i think just realistically because <laughs> I mean, people say uh, Ant's worst matchup is Eldrazi, right? I would think so. That's that's generally the the kind of perception. Goblins with like enough targeted cyborg cards is essentially just faster Eldrazi with more mana denial, right? <laughs> like that's that's uh, if if you've got four chalices and mind breaks and cabal therapies, that's that's going to be a a hell of a lot to fight through. Though I mean, like. The, the number one thing about, like, goblins versus combo in general is kind of seeing who has what in terms of cyborg and anti-cyborg cards. So for a long time, I really liked playing, and part of why I like playing Cup All Therapy right now is because chalices and other permanent forms of hate are, like, really well prepped for. And so I really enjoyed boarding against Cup All Therapies and then, like, one thorn of amethyst or something you know like some number of permanents mm -hmm. so they have to respect it but then you like therapy them and then their hand is like hercules recall echoing truth and you just take the action and just leave them dead cards in their hand um so i think that's a huge part of, of sideboarding i think with any non-blue deck honestly is being where your opponent isn't right they're going to expect you to have a certain kind of sideboard hate and if you can hit them with a different permanent type from a different angle uh, you're going to be a lot more successful. And so to beat Ant with Goblins, if they have all this super crazy hate, you know, they're hitting you from multiple angles. That's tough. So, like, normally Discard beats Mind Break, but Chalice beats Discard. Um, so you're probably going to want some sort of mixed approach. Um, I would imagine, you know, some number of bounce spells with, and then leave in, probably leave in more Discard than, uh, mm -hmm. I like, I don't know, maybe you leave in some number of Duress. Yeah, you, you know what, Philip probably has some channel issues uh, or like bigger issues of the matchup because I know our local Goblin players and for the longest of time they actually used to 
do stuff like four ancient tomes and stuff so they could oh, get, all right, get, like yep. turn nope. one and you're Chalice doomed and stuff. <laughs> you're doomed yeah <laughs> <laughs> and they even they even played blood moons so and blood moons actually surprisingly good against against aunt uh especially if you get like chalice or something because then they're, they're never really gonna get any kind of mana right they can't they can't um, produce their yeah. off colors for like abrupt decay or something yeah. slightly off topic you know what i love the most about ancient tomb the what? best part was when they get, go turn one ancient tomb double other wild. It's like whoa. Oh yeah, I have I have done that. I have done that. My favorite part of ancient tomb is when my opponents go ancient tomb chalice of the void and I go cavern goblin lackey. That's my favorite oh, yeah. part of ancient tomb. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So so if people want to check out the deck, they can probably see it on the stream, right? Uh, is it yes. goblin lackey one on Twitch? Yeah, I'm goblin lackey one on Twitch and on Twitter. Um, I usually post my results like whenever I play a league. It's like just like hey, this is how it went. Um, and then I post all of my stream VODs onto YouTube, also Goblin Lucky one on there. Um, and I stream probably the majority of the magic I play. Um, That's pretty cool. So it's always a work in progress. Do you have a, a schedule or do you play I, like, I, whatever you feel like? <laughs> I kind of play whatever I feel like. I, I try to have a set oh, schedule. The Goblin Wait. Like, I, I, I try to work on it for a while, but it doesn't feel good to play magic when you don't feel like playing magic, right? So yeah. I... I've kind of cut myself to like two times a week and it's usually one weekday, one uh, weekend day. So I'm usually live on Saturday or Sunday and then, you know, some day during the week, but it's usually in the afternoon, evening, usually like evening, uh, Eastern standard time. Cause I work during the day. So usually like 6 PM onward, uh, I'll be somewhere in between there. Awesome. Awesome. So with that, uh, we're, we're actually going to jump into the upcoming M21 spoilers and, Matt, why, why don't you want to read out your favorite card from what we are see, gonna see in M twenty one, which is gonna release, I think, next month, July. It's pretty exciting. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great new cards coming out. Some that I'm excited about, and some that I'm like, oh, really, really? <laughs> this needed to happen. Okay, fine. Um, so the first card that I'm personally excited about is the new Garrick called Garrick Unleashed, which has the traditional Garrick mana cost of two GG. Starts at four. Uh, he goes up one to give one target creature plus three plus three and trample. Pretty darn good until end of turn. Minus two, create a three three beast. Then if you still control less creatures than your opponent, you can add a loyalty counter. So it's only a minus one basically. And then your minus seven is you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step. You may search your library for a creature card and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. So do I like this guy? Yes. Yes, I do. I'm a big fan of, say, for example, you're playing around with your big dudes and you can't get through. Uh, maybe you have a true nemesis on the other uh, other side there and you're like, oh man, I wish I had trample. And then you cast Garrick, pump, and swing past their true nemesis and you deal a bunch of trample damage to their Oko or something. I don't know. Uh, it seems pretty exciting for me. Uh, the minus two to create a beast, I don't know if that's quite as... I mean, I would have been okay with... You know, minus one. Just keeping it minus one, create a beast. I don't know. Maybe that'd be too good. But yeah. it's just me. I don't know. I don't know. Like like on Garrick, uh, Garrick Veil Cursed and uh, the other side, I can't remember his name right now, but, you know, you were relentless. creating two... T you're relentless. You're creating two two wolves that do nothing, or you're creating death touch wolves and you're upping. So it's like, eh, I don't know. I think they could have pushed this a little harder. I don't know. What about yeah, you I think doing? it's a tough sell over Gar Relentless, which you just mentioned earlier, right? Yeah, like I don't, I, I'd be hard pressed to pick one over the other. Uh, they both have advantages and disadvantages. I just like that they're, they're at least pushing Garrick again instead of like I think one of them was like a seven mana Garrick, and you're just like, okay, great. Dude, when am I never disrespect this? the Apex Predator. <laughs> I know, but Apex like Predator the guy, the guy literally kills a planeswalker. I know, but they could have pushed him at least a little bit. Maybe make more dedicated mana cost, right? Instead of, I don't know, I think he's like, what, five? And yeah, it's green... five green-black, I think. Yeah, they could have made him like, I don't know, green-black? <laughs> like, what? Black, green, yellow, green, green, black, black, black. black. <laughs> I want him to be green, pushed. Green, 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 black, black, black. Yeah, I don't know. Just could have made yeah, him. Like, and he comes to being... play with like 25 loyalty or something. Oh, God, please no. Anyway. I mean, it still wouldn't see play. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my point is, I think this is a great release for people who are excited about playing Garrick as a planeswalker. Is he better than Relentless? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I agree with you. The, the minus two is just a slight bit too steep. Like, I, I like the 
the design of like if if it's if you have less creatures it's only minus one that's pretty cool like it thematically it makes this like you know he's this hunter and he gets better if he's outnumbered because he feels stronger and more trapped and stuff that's pretty cool but yeah the trample is pretty good as well when you have three threes making six six tramples is going to kill people fast but yeah i think it's slightly missing a bit i think the problem with the card is there's not really a deck that says this is what i need that like the power level i i don't hate the power level like this is almost a little too high for the power level i love the most in legacy for, for me like the always the central best example of good power level on a planeswalker is Elspeth knight errant which is just like where i want to be for a pow- for a healthy power level this is uh, almost slightly better but i guess you could argue about that but the fact that i would go out on a limp and say this is not gonna see legacy play tells you a lot about the current power level and yeah it's unfortunate because the artwork is really sweet as well like i would be fine if it was creating like plus one and then you get your one one death touch wolf from relentless then i'd be like you know this is how you get power creep Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is how you end up at oko (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> uh, I, uh, this card doesn't register as particularly legacy playable to me. Like, I'm not sure what decks want a four green mana, uh, you know, two green green planeswalker that you know pumps creatures and makes beasts like like Maverick would play. I think people would still play Garrick Relentless over this in most decks. Um, and Garrick Relentless is like ne- very very niche. Um, like, it, it, I don't know. It just seems so much worse to cast any of these Garrix over Oko or Uro, unfortunately. I think we need to have a payoff card for playing as many Garrix as possible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Garrick Isn't travel. that Garrick's companion? No, that, that actually that, that's no. That's just a little creature. Anyway, we've already spent way too much on a card that's not going to see legacy play. Let's talk about another <laughs> card that's not going to see legacy play. <laughs> Elder Gargaroth. Raw. It's a th- makes me sad. five mana, so three colorless and two green for a six six. Vigilance, reach, trample. I was gonna say, should we play a game? Which abilities doesn't it have first? <laughs> Actually, vigilance, reach, trample. That that sounds like, isn't that like what, what's his name? Uh, questing beast. No, no, the oh, big guy. Things that Shifting have things. No, the big guy, um, Rurik Thar. Rurik Thar. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's a big fairy monster. That's yeah, big... yeah. And uh, the so, cool ability. Yeah, so the, bili- the ability is whenever Elder Gagaroth attacks or blocks, choose one. Create a 3 3 beast creature token, gain three life, or draw a card. So this applies whenever it attacks or blocks. So and best case scenario, shorts. you get two of those over a single turn cycle, which is probably not really ever going to happen unless your opponent is like in a really weird spot. But yeah, it's a 5-5. Five, five. It's a 5 mana for a 6-6 six, six Vigilance Reach Trample. This is already pretty good. It, I would say it's better than Spirit Monger, which to me always used to be like the, the litmus test for like how good can a 5-5 five, five be. But yeah, now, now we got this. Uh, Matt, this is the kind of card for you. Do, do you see this doing something in Legacy? So then you cast this, and then they go, Oko, plus one. It's an elk now. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> That's the problem. Is this, is this the new the hashtag dice to removal thing? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you're investing a lot into this. Like, if it came into play and did one of these, maybe that's something. That's the thing. That's that's the level of legacy. You need to have, you don't have to have ETBs or, like, some value when you cast it or something like that. You need you know, it also to do more. also really yeah. sad with this card is you play it, and then your Delver opponent goes, bolt it, flashback, bolt with Arcanist. You, you, you don't even get to trap. You don't even get to block, yeah. Guys, our minds have been poisoned with power creep. Mm-hmm. I just heard that we want a comes into play ability on that guy. I mean, where is this going? It's just I, like it's just like when we saw like Questing Beast. You're like, oh, it has like a bunch of abilities that are really good. It just doesn't have the exact ones that line up with it being a real like actual trump card. And unfortunately, these abilities are not a trump. Pro blue would be very good. Um, you could have an enter the battlefield effect. You can have pro white, um, uncounterable. <laughs> like these are all abilities that Maybe line it up really just well be with four mana. Legacy. I think that would still be bad. It's it feels so horrible. What to say the that. fuck, guys? No, four, I think I think a four mana this, this would see play. I don't know. I I don't think this at four mana would see play either. Honestly, the biggest thing about questing beast seeing play is that it has haste. Yeah, that you can get like yeah. the immediate payoff. And that, that, like, that's the guess... end, that's the ETB kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Well, if way. this had haste, say yeah. it didn't have vigilance, even I'll I'll take away vigilance and it said it said haste reach trample. 
I'll play this card. Yeah, I think it has Witchland, so you can like make use of attack and block. Uh, th being big giant green idiots are like one of my least favorite cards, so I'm, I'm happy this will not see play in legacy. <laughs> yeah. Also, they kind of dropped the ball on the artwork. They could have made it so much better, and that's always like the. I still the final can't quite work out what it play. is. It is hard to work out what it is. Yeah. I really like the birds on the left. <laughs> that's exactly me, right? I see the birds. I was like, let's actually explore the birds a little bit more. Yeah. I think they could actually maybe ping, and, but also deal like <laughs> like add red mana to your mana pool or something. Maybe they're the beasts that they can transform into <laughs> the beasts. Or maybe they are the Elder Gargaroth. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So it, yeah, the main thing is the 3-3 three, three the beast. The center of the, the picture is the 3-3 three, three beast, and the birds yeah. are, are the actual That creature. makes perfect sense. <laughs> so we got it now. Okay, so another card that might actually see play. I'm actually quite excited for it. I am uh, too. It, it has the theme of people in a wooden house looking down on something that I think we also got in a couple of other cards. It's a very common theme on Magic Cards. Village Rides. It's an instant for one yeah. black. As an additional cost to cast a spell, sacrifice a creature, draw two cards. The big, big deal about this is that it's an instant. And that's so one you can mana. actually cash in. Yeah, exactly, right? One mana instant. And whenever your opponent uses spot removal, you can cash in big time on that. Because so just, you lose two cards, basically, and draw three. And yeah, it's basically a plus two. This is Ancestor Recall. So, so just to be clear, this is almost a reprint so we've had alters reap previously yes. which, which was which is exactly the same better. card but it costs two mana it costs one a black so this is still quite a big upgrade to that but the effect has been around for a while but it's to be seen like how big it is from going from two mana to one mana which i think is pretty big i, I was i had a bunch of people message me at the beginning about this card saying oh yeah this seems good for nick fit which it, i think it does and yeah. maybe hogak and stuff Hogak, I think, doesn't actually really care about drawing two cards because you're drawing two cards that you probably want in your graveyard. But I think I was a bit lower on the card at the beginning than I should have been. I think the difference between one and two mana is actually big. And it's the kind of mana you can leave up to sacrifice the creature in response to removal, like you said. So, yeah, I could see this card seeing some play. I think this is the reason this card kind of set off this, like, oh, this is good uh, in my head, was that it's effectively a skull clamp equipment. Or like a equip, like the the casting of it is you're equipping skull clamp right to a one one. Yeah. That's that, but at instant speed. So I really love the idea of you know casting this in response to removal. Um, I've talked to a couple of people about like building a weird goblin shell that uses this as a draw engine instead of ringleader and is more of an aristocrat style deck. Um, I've experimented with those kinds of things before, and this could be really cool in that sort of shell. Any any deck that can exploit. You know tokens or sacrifice outlets and once draw cards would be interested in this i don't know if there's like a clear shell for this other than goblins that pops to my mind um just because a lot of the other like kinds of decks and legacy that put a lot of creatures on board are not really deep into black i'm waiting but, for matt to just say nick fit in the background here well yeah there's nick fit right yeah, <laughs> i'm yeah. waiting for my turn nick fit, nick fit, nick fit, <laughs> nick fit seems like totally makes sense like sacrificing yeah. veteran explorer to this is just pure value oh yeah i want to do that yeah so stating what you just said yeah obviously that's like play number one but also like sometimes you're worried about your recursion engines in nickfit and you're like oh man if they plow this guy i'm never going to be able to like last hope him back or or Valra stronghold him back so sometimes you know getting that extra little bit of value getting those two cards and being able to put in the graveyard instead of exile is mm -hmm. sometimes relevant um, I'm also going to say two other weird cases, more fun than serious. Um, so when you when you're crashing in with your Phyrexian Negator and they decide to lightning bolt you, <laughs> like you you're do. like you're like boom, village rights, and then you get to draw two cards, which is pretty nice. great instead of sacrificing your entire board. Um, and then for your Abyssal Persecutors to have instant oh speed God. removal, I love it. I love it. Are we still in Kansas anymore? <laughs> Do you, do you think this is like a four of in, I don't know what you'd call traditional Nick fit, like, I guess, junk colors. Do you think it's a four of or do you think it's like a card you would build further around? Because with even more sacrifice effects, like obviously the vets are great to sacrifice, but there comes a point in the game where you have like six to eight whatever lands and then you you still want to be like using these therapies in the graveyard for value or extra village rights. Like maybe it does go down a further theme where you have more creatures that sacrifice for value. 
Yeah, or um, or you play maybe more echo creatures where you're going to, like, nuke them anyway, or maybe you just play more tokens, um, token generation. So it's I'm time for Bone with... Shredder to shine. Is that what you're saying? There you go. Hell yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to start with playing two and see if it's just, like, a little bit of incremental value that I want to play or if I'm just going to go deep deep and run the set and see what happens. Calm, do you know exactly where this fits, actually? Buoyant boys. Buoyant boys. Explain what Boy and Boys is. <laughs> uh, Boy and Boys is Yorian Goblins that also plays Birthing Pod. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a it's a very crazy deck that um, Solnox carry uh, built and has five out a couple of leagues with. And I played it on the stream once. It's super super fun. Just to be clear, uh, he five would with 110 cards Nick Fit Goblins pod. No, 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 no. no. Nick. Wasn't it? <laughs> no, no. It, the, he he five would with 110 card Nick Fit. Oh, that sorry. Was like, that was like a prime time, like Field of the Dead. Thing. Yes, yes. Uh, and then he five would once or twice with 81 card. <laughs> 81 <laughs> card Yorian Goblins. Yeah, um, with, with like Resto and Kiki Guys, Jiki I haven't got enough stuff. wine for this. Jesus. Yeah, so so the con- so it has he had one Deceiver Oxark <laughs> with with one Resto Angel uh, and one Kiki Jiki, and I played it and we cut the we cut the Exarch eventually, but Aww. I did get to do the amazing play of uh, Zealous Conscripts, your young Pyromancer. Birthing pod it for Goblin Chain Whirler. Kill oh. your all your tokens. <laughs> That's so and sick. then and then on the following turn, pod chain whirler for restoration angel angel flicker rest or flicker uh, conscripts, untap pod, pod angel for Kiki. Go infinite. <laughs> this sounds like such a modern thing. Have you yeah, seen about legacy? It was so funny. <laughs> uh, guys, something I was actually wondering about rights, because obviously you get the most value out of rights if you do it in response to a removal spell, especially if you do it in response to, for example, say, Abrupt Decay, because then you're even, like, trading up on mana and everything. So I was wondering which kind of deck actually, like, puts a lot of pressure on the opponent to have a removal spell. And that's usually something like like a Stoneforge deck. And Stoneforge isn't that great right now in the format, but maybe we'll see it do something again in the future. So I was wondering whether this could slot into some kind of maybe Asper, Stoneforge deck, Asper dead, Blade, I don't dead, know. Dead, dead guy ale kind like of Lingering Souls, maybe? Ooh, Anything that's, Souls, okay. Yeah. Oh, Lingering Souls, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything really that, that says, okay, you, I'm attacking with an equipment, and if you have, like, Swords of Plowshares or Lightning Bolt or whatever, you gotta use it, because otherwise I'm gonna get value. And then you do this in response, and your opponent feels like shit. And we know that the key to success in Legacy is making the opponent feel like shit. <laughs> so. the, the thing that makes me think that I'm not sure about that is, I think this card, it's it's good in response to a removal spell, but it's not actually, like, insanely powerful, and it's not kind of a game any effect. It's just a good play. It's still very good. But I it's think... up two cards. It's Ancestor Recoil, uh... if you do it like that. Uh... For one mana. That's, that's insanely powerful, I would say. Uh... I don't think it's quite like Ancestral Recall. But the it thing, is. But the thing is... You're, you're basically Recall, getting three cards. But Recall is good because you can just cast any time, yeah, which, which is what yeah, I was getting yeah. to. So I think it's a card where, like, yes, it's really powerful to do in response to a removal spell, but I think you want to play in a deck that, like, actively wants to cast it as well, proactively, as an engine. So, like, Lingering Souls, maybe you do as well, but that seems a bit slow, and maybe you can play, like, of one mind instead. But I don't know. I think I think you do want to be taking advantage of, like being able to sacrifice a creature maybe with like blood ghast or grave crawler so again like hogak i don't think quite fits it but i think there could be some grindy zombie theme something some kind of deck that could could use it yeah also but, by the way you're right you're only up one card basically if you do that because this card is basically card advantage neutral yes. and if you do it in response to remove so it's just plus one not plus two like ancestry card. so you're right so that's basically why it didn't feel as powerful as i was initially setting it at <laughs> it's close uh, it, it, uh, it's, the- it's still good but yeah i think it's like it's almost, almost. Yeah. But the, the, the Lindering Soul stuff, I kind of like. Um, you, you mentioned the zombie stuff, and you were also skeptical about, about Hogak, and I agree, because like a big part of card advantage is that you actually get to use the card advantage for something that interacts yeah. with the board or the stack, like Force of Fills, Thoughts of Plowshares, anything. I mean, and that's not really something that Hogak does, right? One, one way of trying to exploit this would be play it in something with dredge creatures or dredge cards, because draw two cards when you have dredge cards is going to be really powerful. Uh, I was just thinking, what about like a Goblin Bombardment shell? Uh, yeah, totally. Like that that's yeah, the kind of deck that could actually use the cards because you do actually might you you're quite happy to draw these cards very often. Like like it doesn't really play any Stitcher Suppliers or mm-hmm. very few in tombs, I think, I believe usually, because it really does 
rely on like drawing your engines and then just casting the creatures and then going like that. So yeah, I could see this there, definitely. Something that scares me about this kind of card, though, relying as your card draw engine, is uh, my mind just immediately always goes to Chalice. It's like it's relying on uh, a one mana spell for your card advantage always feels a little scary to me just because of Chalice of the Void. You still get to sacrifice the creature, though. It's true. <laughs> true. Yeah, it's, yeah, You're it's not true. wrong. <laughs> so let's see whether this card is actually going to be good. Like, I could see it. it. It's just, I don't know what it is, but I see the artwork and it doesn't look like the artwork of a card that's actually going to see play in Legacy. Um, I don't know. That's so, just so stupid <laughs> and such a casual mind approach. I get it. But though. it reminds me of Bump in the Night. I can't help it. <laughs> I, I absolutely love this artwork. And the card you were mentioning before when introducing the card was um, Village something from Innistrad. Village it's, a, it's, it's a three mana two two, not Village Rights. It's a three mana two two. Uh, yeah. There we go. That's it. <laughs> uh, it's from Innistrad. Right, I'm back. Awesome. This is turning to a fairly long one, so maybe we try and yeah. go through yeah. them a bit faster. Yeah, um, I guess the Goblin is, is important, the Teferi yeah. is important, Barin is important, and the rest we can probably mention. But I think yeah. we could we can just talk about them very quickly. Like we can say like fronting inventory is a, is a new AK. Maybe it's a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. We can we can just say like Sublime yeah. Epiphany is just a cyborg card. Blah blah. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, Sublime so Epiphany is going to be a sideboard card. I think the card is just going to see absolutely zero play. No, just just a one of in Omnitel. It's a, it's, oh, it's oh, that's a good point. It's, okay, it's a trick yeah. bind plus a counter spell plus oh, a bounce something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's it's good. very very good there. Even though that I guess that it gets too technical, then you can't do the thing. I, I guess you could still yeah okay okay. okay. It's, it's like a counter your flick with ability bounce and a can miss. Yeah, yeah. Right, I, I was kind of thinking about like how you bring it in. Um, sometimes you side it in, and yeah. then your um, well, fireman's foresight can like find it as a two. And but yeah, that's two. That's, yeah. Anyway. So another card that actually led us to to reach out to you and to get your thoughts on that card is Conch... Guys, uh, I'm going to let the native speakers pronounce that. Conspicuous Snoop. There we go. That was actually easier than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's two red for a 2-2 Goblin Rogue. Play with the top card if your library is revealed. You may cast Goblin's spells from the top of your library. As long as the top card of your library is a Goblin card the dude has all activated abilities of that card. This card is broken, oh my god. It's so sweet. And yeah. it's not even a legend. Like, I, I thought, like, I, lo I look at the name and everything, I'm like, oh, this might be a legend. No, it's not. So is this going to slot right into Goblins? Yeah, it. this card seems really good. Goblins has really wanted um, additional card filtering and card advantage outside of the Matron Ringleader engine for a while because it does kind of suck to have your card advantage condensed into those eight slots. Um, and so Snoop can allow us to, um, lower the curve a little bit, because you can probably drop, I think, one to two ringleaders will end up getting shaved for this. My gut feeling was two ringleaders. Um, it depends on how many Snoops you want to play. I think it's a three to four of, I'm leaning towards three, partially because of the intense color requirements. Um, like, I think I'm going to cut a colorless land. I'm going to cut a port for another red source. So we have 17 red sources. And I might play a second Prospector. So this this card this card's really interesting because, I mean, the thing that people immediately looked to is this combo with uh, Bugger Harbinger and Kiki Jiki. Um, and so the way this combo is, so Bugger Harbinger is a two and a black for a two one, enters the battlefield. Um, it's Vampiric Tutor for a Goblin. So it's like if Matron is Demonic Tutor, uh, Harbinger is Vampiric Tutor. But in this with Snoop, uh, Harbinger is kind of better, right? So, so the, the combo is you put Kiki Jiki on top of your deck. Um, because Kiki Jiki says non-legendary, it's not that it can't copy itself; it's just that it can't copy non-legends. With since Snoop doesn't become legendary, but it gains Kiki Jiki's ability, you can tap Snoop, target Snoop, tap Snoop, target Snoop, make infinite Snoops. And then at the end of that, so you make an arbitrary number of Snoops, and then you target Parker Harbinger one more time. You put Sling Gang Lieutenant on top of your deck, and then you can drain them for infinity. Or it also works with Mark Fanatic. It's it's a pretty compact combo. Like so Snoop is very good on its own. Kiki Jiki has been played in the past as a mm -hmm. one-off anyway. It's pretty good to like copy matrons and ring leaders, obviously. Yeah. Um and now it's even got like 
expert as a copy target, which is pretty good. Yeah. Also, so, I'm a big fan of copy pile driver for. Uh, yeah. Just big huge damage swings. output. Yeah. So it's Kini's a pretty good card anyway. Like, but then Harbinger's not. You say it's Vampire Tudor, like that makes it sound better than it is. It's yeah, not that's a great true. Card. It's it's a pretty bad card. <laughs> yeah, Har- but, Harbinger is not even close to legacy playable like yeah. by itself. So so that's the cost of playing this card. But so would you play like how many Harbingers do you think you'd play? I am most interested in running as little Harbinger as possible. Um, I feel like one to two is what. Yeah, like. So maybe start uh, out higher and then see how it goes. Kind yeah, of you might you might test with like three just to see like how effective the combo actually is because this combo is very fragile, right? Like obviously you can get it all around counter magic through cavern and vial, which is very cool. Um, but it's uh, yeah, but it get, really it's, only dies to a removal spell, right? It yeah, it dies to graveyard. Dice, it, that's true. I guess I guess in that sense it's more resilient. I mean, than, I, I could honestly see. It where like the combo is just so good and it's so easy to assemble or so threatening and snoop is good enough on its own just as a card you play that you really actually do play four harbingers like i think that's quite realistic as well i i would really hate that world to be honest but <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean so which turn are we actually looking at if, you, if you're trying to assemble that combo or, or like it, incidentally it, randomly get it is it like a turn three thing yeah you can do it on turn three pretty easily um because it's just turn two snoop turn three harbinger win you can do it um, if you don't have one of the pieces. You can do like Turn One Lackey. Uh, if it connects, put in Matron, get Harbinger, uh, then cast Snoop, and then you went on turn three. Um, there's a lot of ways to turn three it. Um, I think that that is a super powerful thing. Like, you just play the Snoop on turn two, and they really have to kill it. Like, the, yeah, that, it, the... it's going to snowball with card advantage. Like, it can find goblins to play. Like and then if you can just play this harbinger and win. So like against snow, for example, now like you know turn two they either want to ponder or astrolabe or play a coatl or something. They have to plow or decay it. Like, right. or they might just die. Yeah, uh, you, you probably get to race combo decks a lot easier now. Like yeah, like goblins is this is the goblins has always had a a turn three kill possibility. Like it's not improbable. Like lackey into sling gang and pile driver is a turn three kill. Lackey, Warchief, Double Pile Driver is like the classic turn three kill. Um, there are ways to do it, but this is like very card, uh, yeah. very easy on card economy. Um, my my kind of hesitation with it is Parker Harbinger is a really bad card. Um, and I really liked having no five drops in my deck, so I never had to take Vile up to five. Yeah, those are both good points. And also should, it should be noted that the combo doesn't, and it doesn't get around uh, Plague Engineer in the most common sense. So if yes. you it kills the Harbinger, so you can't actually copy it. But you can kiki jiki like end of turn and make the tokens. But it requires another turn cycle. Yeah, yeah. So you could end you could end of your opponent's turn, make infinite one ones, and then they'll untap, and then you can swing. But yeah. that's definitely more vulnerable. I mean, that's a recipe of far success, kinda. That that's what F's been doing for for years. Like you, you can grind out your opponent very well, but you also have to, like a very rather consistent turn three combo kill if they don't disrupt you. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you I, our guests always have a thing for getting me excited <laughs> for decks. <laughs> and then I play them, and then I get let down because I don't play them very well. And well, luckily goblins won't do that. So <laughs> yeah, well, actually, well, I think, I, think, you. The, yeah. I mean the part of this card that I'm most excited about is really the the you can cast the top card of your library because this is oh, yeah, we this didn't is, even talk about that. This yet. is this is Mystic Forge on that a is goblin. So powerful as well. Like <laughs> that's crazy, yeah. uh, and it really encourages you to lean more into the um, prospector, war chief, Mogwar marshal kind of shenanigans because. If you have, you know, these kinds of these synergies assembled, you, it's almost like food chain without ever needing food chain, because you can, you know, cast a couple of goblins. Oh, you hit a land, cast matron, just shuffle, get ringleader, cast the next couple of goblins, and you're sacking, you know, your mogwar marshals to generate mana, so you're staying mana neutral throughout the exchange, and you can just like flip your your deck onto the table, you know, you draw effectively draw and play, you know, six seven cards in a single turn, and then. You know how, how how do you lose from there, right? <laughs> yeah, the card is just fantastic. I would have thought this would be like three mana rather than two. Yeah, this is crazy. Especially. This is two mana. So um, cuts are going to be difficult. Um, 
I was really happy with the way I have the build set up right now, where it's like I've got, I, I, I maybe it's just like a, an aesthetic thing, but I really like having three pile driver, three crater maker, three Mogwar Marshal, three munitions expert. Something about that, I just, I just love like having the three of all the two drops. You're the opposite of uh, Marcus. I would like to be respond truck is he just plays two orbs and four orbs, and he absolutely hates ones and three orbs. So you two are like the yin yang, the blue uh, and the red. You should call him Geruda, Marcus Geruda. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Odd numbers are not for him. Uh, so uh, it cuts cuts will be tricky. Um, everyone's trying different things. You know, I really want to fit a second prospector in there, and there'll be a question of we have to up the red source count. Do we keep Rashad and Port around? This card's I'm really excited that this card is really good with Valrath Stronghold. <laughs> mm-hmm. True, very true. Oh um, yeah. So I might like play a, a copy in the board for like grindier matchups, uh, increasing redundancy. And the other exciting thing about Snoop is just that it increases threat density of Goblin Surat a lot. Where you know, now if you kill the Termin Lackey, you might not have the removal spell for Snoop. And so that it's either going to kill you or draw some cards. And so now that has, now the more like must kill uh, cards goblins can get, the better the deck will become because it just becomes increasingly taxing on the opposing removal. It's funny when you guys speak about goblins and like all the sweet cards that you have and all the sweet things that you can do and you got to make room for them. It, it really makes me feel like the deck is like, an EDH deck in, in you, you get <laughs> yeah, all yeah. these amazing things going on that EDH players love. Maybe right. maybe you should build that. But moving on, there's there's another card that actually is predicted to maybe make uh well there were like different leaked versions of this upcoming to ferry. Uh ones that were insanely broken where like the entire planeswalker had flash, uh, I think. But the one the version we got now is to ferry master of time two blue blue. Uh, Planeswalker 3 Loyalty. You may activate loyalty abilities of Teferi Master of Time on any player's turn any time you could cast an instant. So before we go into the actual abilities of the Planeswalker, that means you can activate Teferi on your turn and then on the opponent's turn again. So you basically get two activations out of Teferi per turn cycle, which is a really big deal. So keep that in mind when you're evaluating the, the other abilities. So the plus one Draw a card, then discard a card. Classic looting, Mavrock Looter. Minus three. Target creature you don't control phases out. And for people who haven't been around like 500 years ago when phasing was conceived, <laughs> that basically means you literally just treat the card as if it didn't exist for a turn. And that sounds weird, but that's really how it works. It doesn't leave play. It doesn't come into play. You just you basically act as if you had forgotten that card existed. And that's what it does for minus three. So if you do that immediately, it basically kills itself. But I guess you could like plus one it on your turn and then minus three it on the opponent's turn. And then the minus 10 is take two extra turns after this one. So the, the plus one is actually a plus two. So it's not unreasonable to take those extra two turns, but... It's pretty far away. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not something you do like on the next or the very next turn. It's it's nicely designed so that you play it, it pluses to four, and then on your opponent's turn you can phase a creature that's trying to attack it out or something. So it does protect itself, which is quite nice. But looting is not really very powerful. I like, for for a four mana card when you have like I know it does protect itself and you, you do get to activate it twice. You get to loot every turn cycle if you can protect it. It only that's, protects it. That's the thing. Like it only once. protects it from one creature. Yeah, exactly. And then it go it go down to one. Yeah. So I'm not very high on this card personally. I think it's it's just not quite there for four mana when you could be playing Jace, which is already kind of being pushed out a bit. Yeah, yeah. it's I'm, it's pretty think, neat design. I'm glad it's not too pushed because like some of the leaked versions were insane. Like having it f- have flash was completely ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty glad it it looks like this. And so maybe it could be a little bit more powerful than I expect, but. I don't see this doing very much personally. I wonder what it's going to be like in standard. Where, like everybody hates, hates hates Teferi in standard, so it's just <laughs> like, hey, let's print another version of Teferi that might destroy standard. So here we go. This seems way <laughs> less obnoxious than uh, Teferi Time Rivalry because it's not just like, oh, well, you have to ignore a fundamental part of the game. Like this this card seems pretty reasonable That's to me. True. Yeah. It's cool design. Um, I'm like normally it. like pretty down on Planeswalkers in general because uh, I'm kind of sick of them, but. This one seems like it's it part can of the goblin some... lifestyle. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> this one can do some like cool things, but nothing's like broken. I, yeah, you know, I think I don't so, think yeah, this card will see legacy play though. I would guess that. Yeah, I think that the big hype that came with it was part of um, the earlier leaked versions that were totally insane. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. Moving on. 
there's uh, a card. It's called Cholral Mon. Okay, that somebody <laughs> rolled over with the head on their keyboard <laughs> and then added recluse. <laughs> Cholral Monvuli recluse. It's yeah, there we go. Monvuli, one yeah. two human druid for one colorless and a green. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a two two green cat creature token. And for six mana, until end of turn, creatures you control have base power and toughness XX, where X is the number of lands you control. So... Number of cards in your hand. Oh, yeah, that's actually how it works. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think this card's pretty cool. I think it might, again, like kind of be one of these, you can theorize with it and you can have some ideas and it's going to fall a little bit short. But I could honestly see this being, see, uh, could see this seeing some play in Delver, like as a one or two of, as a threat, like... You, you ponder or you brainstorm or you, maybe you have a sylvan library or you arcanist to flashback a cantrip or something like two two tokens are pretty relevant in delver so so you're I mean, saying this would be like an upgrade to a pyromancer in like a rug delver shell yeah potentially i think there's enough ways that you draw your second card to make a few tokens like pyromancer never really gets completely out of control either mm -hmm. so i don't know two twos are pretty they're twice as big as a one one so that, that was my first thought for this and then it's pretty good with sylvan library because in any green decks so mm. you could you draw your second third and fourth card whatever so you get a 2-2 every time with sylvan library so it could be a pretty good just uh green suns in the target you can protect it with caracas in green sun decks you get a lot of mana so maybe you can like pump your whole team as well so i think it could be a one of in a few de different decks it gives you an incentive to cast brainstorm on the opponent's turn i guess yes yeah, true it's true <laughs> That's that's something you can do, yeah. But overall, um, like I'm gonna say, it's not not gonna see play, right? It's, okay. I, I could be wrong. Like it, what it does, um, that's actually neat. There's these all these these stompy decks, these green stompy decks, and they they use seven library and stuff, and they never really have any good two drops. And that's true. I guess yeah. if you if you're gonna play a deck that has like a ton of seven libraries, and then maybe some of this, you you can play some reasonable two drops. But is this that better than Tomer Wave though? That's the thing, right? It goes wider. It goes much wider. In Green Stompy, I'm sure it is. Like, mm. they don't I really guess, feel yeah, Green Stompy, the Goists don't actually get that big. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly thinking of like a just a one of Green Stompy's end of the target. Hmm. But I think it does enough things. I mean, like you can use it with like Tireless Tracker as well. And Being a legend is a pretty significant downside, though. True. True. Or well, you fail a summer to like more of those. <laughs> you have, imagine you had like two of those and you, you cast ponder you get like four power that would, pretty, that, that would, that would be pretty nuts yeah <laughs> sign me up uh, moving on there's another creature that we are actually like actually quite excited about from what I've seen in the Esper Wild chat uh, Baron Tularian Archmage a colorless and two blue a 2-2 two -two human wizard when Baron Tularian Archmage enters the battlefield Return up to one other target creature or planeswalker to its owner's hand, so it bounces anything, any creature or planeswalker. And then, at the beginning of your end step, if a permanent was put into your hand from the battlefield this turn, draw a card. So the the first use of it is pretty straightforward, right? You you can cast it on your main face or use it off while and bounce any creature or planeswalker that's annoying you. So that's more like a tempo play. But then if you use that to actually bounce something of your own or get something of your own into play anyway. Like, it doesn't have to be the thing that Baron bounced, right? Then you get to create a card advantage engine, kinda. I wonder if that's, like, too many moving pieces, because Baron also got, got to survive until the end of the turn, and at the end of the day, it's really just, like, a 2-mana, yeah. a 3-mana, 2-2. Two -two. I, th I think it's it's hard to say. The more I read it and the more I think about it, the, the more I come down a little bit. I think it could be a one-off, like, as a tutor target, the the first ability the bounce thing is good like bouncing a bouncing a planeswalker is not bad but in a deck like Esper Vile, you usually have a pretty good board so you can usually just like want to be attacking the planeswalkers the the end step bouncing thing it's not really a thing that Esper Vile does it flickers things or tutors for them and you don't really bounce things f from play back to your hand very much so there is another card we'll talk about soon which I think could actually make this card a lot better Oboru. No, the uh, oh yeah, Aboru is a cute way to do it. So Aboru is the legendary land which you can pay one colorless to return it to mm -hmm. your hand. So that's a pretty cool way to use it. Uh, at the same time, the deck is also pretty mana hungry, right? So yeah, I don't yeah. really want to do that. Yeah, too I don't. Much. I don't know if Esper Vile needs another three drop. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's a it's a cool bouncy thing. Um, I, I think humans might. I've heard some 
people who play Legacy Humans be pretty interested in this card. Like, I know Eddie Zamora is really excited to, to try this and, like, adjust the shell to be able to cast it and use it. Because they've cut Reflector Mage because Bounce is just not a very good way of interacting with a lot of creatures in the format. But if it, also Bouncing Planeswalkers, I think, is a really nice thing for humans because they don't have Planeswalker removal, so they always have to attack them. And sinking a whole bunch of damage into killing stuff like Oko can be a a big loss just in of itself is like you lose the whole combat step and with humans that uh is quite an aggressive deck getting to just bounce the oko and then hit face is pretty appealing yeah i could see that okay yeah i, I think it'd be close it's, yeah maybe humans maybe one of us esper vile but i'm kind of falling short on it so yeah all right uh next one we have is just a very quick one is sublime epiphany so this is this was like announced as having 31 different modes i think it was i'm gonna be oh, that's the one? Oh yeah 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 so it's a four and blue blue instant and it has choose one or more of these modes so it's counter target spell counter target activated or triggered ability return target non alarm permanent to its owner's hand create a token that's a copy of target creature control or target player draws a card i think for six mana to do these things is completely unplayable in legacy apart from i think it's going to be a cyborg card and omnitel so you can kind of wish for it because very often you want to have like a trick bind so you can counter a uh, reclamation sage or a flicker wisp you've put in off show and tell and then you have omissions in play but then it also like draws a card it can bounce a permanent it can you can you can wish for it sometimes naturally so yeah i think it's just that use otherwise pretty bad card yep. yeah i agree Next one is actually a really weird card, which is going to go into Storm, potentially. It's called Peer into the Abyss. So it's four black, 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 so seven mana total for sorcery. Target player draws cards equal to half the number of cards in their library and loses half their life, round up each time. So this, there's actually been a very good article explaining the pros and cons to this over and against uh, Ad Nauseum in TES. So I'd go over to TES.com and read that for a full breakdown. But... um. Yeah, there's no- Alex Alex McKinley, I think, wrote that. Article. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I read that the other day. It was very good. So, um, I would I would honestly just divert to them. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're, they're a lot smarter <laughs> when talking about the deck than this me. is the legacy podcast where we just tell you where to go and not listen <laughs> yeah. to us. I was about to basically like rehash what he said, but I, I would recommend that. But I said, so I said what essentially, is he saying? He's, he's essentially saying like there's enough times where it's almost all the time going to be two mana more than ad nauseum. But a lot of the time, their ad nauseum lines involve this extra two mana by burning, wishing for an infernal tutor in the sideboard anyway. So it's easy enough to set up. Um, and then you can just do it from a much, much lower life total, right? So you can do it for, when you're at two life, you can draw the same amount of cards, roughly, as if you were at like 18, 19 life with ad nauseum. You just go down to one life. So you can go off slower if you need to, or you can use your life total as more of a resource. The big downside is this is really bad against Leovold or Narset. Whereas ad nauseum kind of gets around that, so um, th- those are the biggest pros and cons from what I remember. They'll, they'll, def- I think the idea is that people will definitely experiment with it, and there's been some people also talking about just like playing in either ant or with the actually jet medallion, with like all the oh, black wow. rituals and stuff, which is kind of deep. Which that's from Jax, but um, yeah, I, th- I think <laughs> the, the home is going to be TES if there's a home. To me, it so, seems th- weird that it's not considered an ant more because ants the worst ad nauseum deck ever, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. Like, like this, this seems, and they can, and they can generate more mana with cabal rituals. So I feel like it makes more sense to bring in for as a cut for ad nauseum. Maybe. And, I think the idea for them is they use past and flames as like the same effect. Like I guess if, if they the have that game. much mana, yeah. Yeah. So I guess if and then I mean, in, hmm. they they have less fast mana as well. So if they draw like they'd have to work out the average number of cards they draw but if they draw 15 to 20 cards they still need to draw lotus petals to start going off further whereas mm-hmm. tes has um chrome mox and and, and mox opal, opal. Yeah. yeah the thing, thing about peer and the abyss uh, compared to ad nauseum that's that, that there's two things i don't like about it uh the first one is you mentioned how very often ad nauseum is a seven mana spell anyways because you gotta use your tutors but the thing is, you also get to use LED, whereas for this one, you don't really get to use LED. Because if you want to use LED and use a tutor, then you're actually looking at 9 mana at this point. So is is this going to yeah. like reconstruct the deck in an entire different way where you don't do you Like, I couldn't, I can't see that, like, not using LED anymore. But then that's a totally different deck at that point. And then right. I agree, uh, like, 
that's probably going to be more like a cable ritual deck or something. Yeah, it gets to a lot uh, of mana to cast the cards. I think that's going to be the real bottle point, uh, bottleneck, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So. so let's see if that's going to see play. Um, I'm not mm-hmm. so sure about it, even though the effect is insanely powerful. The effect should like, win you the game pretty much every single time. Maybe that's actually like more of an nauseam card. Oh, and by a uh, uh, foreign Pasicho card. And by the way, mm-hmm. something that also does come up quite often, actually, f- when I play control decks against against uh, A and T, especially, it's an, not an instant. And mm-hmm. I've been end of turn at nauseam quite a bit. And then you gotta make these weird decisions because you like you obviously want to counter counter it, but then your mana is tapped and stuff like that. That's a line I, I think that does come up quite a bit. Yeah, that, very true. That you can't do with this one. Very true. And speaking of counter spells, there's a new um, halfway between. I don't even know what to, what to call it. It's, like it's called Fluster Storm Spell Pierce. Fl- yeah, Fluster Storm Spell Pierce is what I was thinking. Thing. Yeah, the, the best child of Fluster Storm and Spell Pierce. Miscast for one blue instant. Counter target instant or sorcery spell unless its controller pays three. I see almost no reason to run this over Fluster Storm. Oh, like, obviously, yeah. it's not like strictly worse, but. Like, come on, Flaster Storm. That, that's I just agree. like, yep. Okay. I just thought it was like worth mentioning. It there's like, actually, I can't even think of a world where you'd play it over Flaster Storm. <laughs> if Flaster Storm wasn't modern legal, then this might see modern play. Mm-hmm. Fair. That's but true. It is. That's true. <laughs> but it is, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, another card: Eliminate one colorless and a black instant. Destroy target creature or planeswalker with converted mana cost three or less. This is kind of like abrupt decay, um, but not really. But yeah, why I find this interesting is it gives blue black X, like just either straight blue black or Esper, especially some decks, some real removal against uh, Oko and Teferi and stuff. They they struggled in this area before, and it's they had like the Elder spell which can kill Planeswalkers and stuff, but that's just way too narrow. But this can also just destroy creatures as well, Delvers, Arcanists, Oko, uh, Uros, what have you. So I think this is like the kind of card that we played one or two of in Esper kind of decks, and it might give them a little bit more life to be playable now that they can answer Uro easier, because otherwise they were just using like uh, Council Judgment and stuff, which is just so slow. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad this of, card exists. I'm like yeah. I'm happy to see this card. Yeah, it feels very fair for the cost, and it mm-hmm. it feels just good enough to play, be played in Legacy, but nothing exciting really. But it's, it's just cool. a good answer, but. Yeah. I probably don't see like it's yeah, it, it's certainly not bad. But I think it, playing paying two mana to just maybe remove something is doesn't feel like that's cutting it in legacy anymore. Yeah, but yeah. The added flexibility of like in the decks where you don't have abrupt decay, I, I can certainly see that. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another card there's frantic inventory, which is basically strictly different from accumulated knowledge. Like it's neither worse nor better, I guess. Strictly it's, different. It's strictly uh, different. Yeah, strictly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a colorless in the blue. Draw a card, then draw cards equal to the number of cards named frantic inventory in your graveyard. So like accumulated knowledge, but it only counts your graveyard, which is better. If your opponent, no, it's not even better or worse when your opponent no. plays like IKEA as well. It's it just it doesn't scale as hard. It's got the new frame, so I think it's really worse. Yeah, I think that's. I think <laughs> honestly, even though this card exists, I think people are just going to play accumulated knowledge because it's older and they yeah. like their old cards. I think so. Yeah, well. and Nemesis is just like the best set ever. I agree. Okay, cool. <laughs> Moving on, we have this girl, uh, Nyambi, esteemed speaker, a white and a blue for a two-one human cleric. She has Flash, and when Yambi, esteemed speaker, enters the battlefield, you may return another target creature you control to its owner's hand. If you do, you gain life equal to the creature's converted mana cost. And then for a colorless, a white, and a blue, and tap, discard a legendary card, draw two cards. So like friend of the podcast, a Wilson Hunter pointed out, this is insanely good with Emra Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, how much do you value 15 life? I guess you can take an miracle hit then. Yeah, true. And then you discard it and you draw two cards. So it's, for the, it's, it's, it's for the Sneak and Show Mirror. I see, I see. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this going to be a thing in Legacy? Like, it has a lot of text that does r- rather relevant stuff. And even like the life gain these days, I, I don't know. I've gotten to appreciate life gain much more than I used to. Yeah, yeah, so this is the card that I was referencing when we were talking about Baryon earlier. So... When she ETBs, you return some uh, creature you control to your in his hand. This then triggers his end of turn, draw an extra card thing. So hmm. it's a nice little engine, and blue-white colors have a lot of cards that you like to bounce back to your hand and recast and stuff. 
But um, Blue White had this card called Deputy of Acquittals, which was a two mana flash, two two, that did the same thing. You bounce something, but without the life gain. So what makes this good, though, I think, it is the extra ability of discard a legendary card, draw two cards for three mana, and tapping it. So this is a legendary card, not creature. So you can like play Caracas in your deck, and you can play multiples, and then you can discard your extra Caracas when you draw them to draw two cards, or you like. I mean, this is obviously a legendary, so is Baron. You can draw extras, and it's always really horrible to draw extra legendaries. So yeah, just discard them, draw two, draw two cards. So I think that's a pretty relevant part of the card. Um, it also has a nice little trick again in blue-white. Maybe you play Spell Queller. You can play Spell Queller, and with the ETB of exiling Ooh. a spell in the stack, you can cast her or vial her in, and then bounce the Spell Queller. By doing that, you then exile the spell, and then you... you Sorry, you recast the exile spell, but you still haven't actually exiled the spell yet. So you can then uh, exile the spell forever with this trick of spell Koala and Niambi. So I think I'm quite excited to actually experiment with like a blue white flash vile deck. That's as far as I've gotten. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it'd like be DNT esque with like Thalia, maybe or Stoneforge Mystic or something, but be taking a lot of like leaves out of the Esper Vile book as well. It seems like a natural fit for a vile Thalia deck to me, just because I know, you know draw, drawing multiple Thalias can be really brutal. Like having watched a fair bit of Death and Taxes, like the, the the second and third Thalia that like rots in your hand is yeah. pretty brutal. So having a way to convert that into cards is pretty exciting. The mana ability is pretty mana intensive though, so I'm a little skeptical on that. Yeah, I think it's just like when you're playing something like Recruiter of the Guard, it's just pretty good to be able to bounce things to it yeah, up it, it gives true. the deck some really really strong like grindy late game engines similar to esper vile whereas in dnt you're playing your recruiter and then getting your bullet and that's it but this gives you like a, a further engine so yeah i'm excited for it how do you feel julian i think you you called it uh um may i quote blue white flash wire control deck and yeah like whenever like people say that something like that i always feel like that the power level of the supposed deck is is indirectly proportional to the duration of the pauses you take between the words <laughs> that's fair. If you know what i mean <laughs> that's, that's that's fair well I, mean, I hadn't really gotten further than i want to play in the ambi with baron and like a bunch of caracas and vile and then the thing is they're both blue like i think you can play this dnt esque deck that supports forces and stuff and it's pretty powerful yeah maybe that's the future of dnt like yeah. we, we had it like as a as a talking point earlier today that we didn't really fully explore because we don't want to like be so down on dnt but we were talking about whether goblins is the new dnt in, in the sense that it's actually better now so it's blue and white like i would love to see something like that like blue and white wild deck i'd be down like i already love esper wild maybe, maybe yeah i mean it might be true that you just play black anyway in this shell but yeah, I'm not sure why I'm fixated on just straight blue white. Honestly, I well, like manas, I like clean so mana. Better, right? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll see. Esper Vile does have a bit of a dubious mana base, and I don't know if this kind of effect is what it's looking for. Right, uh, Esper Vile already has lots of ways of flickering things and drawing cards. I feel like that deck has a a clock issue more than anything else. It does, <laughs> at least on Magic Online. It's the only deck where I actually have to make a conscious effort to not play slow, whereas everything else I usually end up with like I don't know way enough time on the clock. Yeah, yeah. But I, don't, I, I wasn't. I guess I meant I meant clock in terms of clocking your opponent, but also clock in terms of it takes a long oh, time dude. to win. I guess the, the you don't want to speak to Chef. If you ever want to speak to Chef, you can never bring up that aspect of the deck. No, I, that's no. <laughs> you get shot down on that. Rightfully so, though. I gotta say, like I, I think the clock aspect is really secondary to just the establishing either like a position where you you hit them for one for two or sometimes you even have the most absurd game stats where you you to ferry them twice a turn or something and then then it's really only a matter of like how doing it instead of how you do it but i i, I see the point yeah yeah definitely the last card we wanna talk about i guess there's not too much to say about it. it's just like a pretty historic thing uh grim tutor is getting a reprint so for those who don't know grim tutor used to be kind of like be a thing in the past in legacy ad nauseum tendrils it's one colorless and two black search your library for any card put into your hand then shuffle your library and lose three life it's basically the, a fixed version of demonic tutor and i guess it's fixed enough that it doesn't see play yeah i think uh, martin von is going to kill me but i think it's pretty bad like you can build to incorporate it in the decks but yeah i mean just just wait until 42 ad wrecks <laughs> you with it 
Yeah, that that is Martin Vonisek. Oh, okay. Yeah, Force <laughs> AD, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, people have said that the reason Grim Tutor didn't see more play was because of the price, but then Magic Online exists, so, yeah. Yeah. But pretty cool reprint. I like it. Great art as well. Does it do anything in other formats? Like, uh, is, is modern have anything hmm. relevant? I don't think so. I guess what it actually does the most in modern is it gives you access to to sideboard silver bullets or sideboard answers in, in combo decks. There's, very, there's just no black based combo decks that I'm right because all the all the rituals are red. Is that nauseum? I guess, but yeah. And nauseum is great. I love that deck. Yeah, that's, it's true. not really great in modern anymore. Maybe it's there. Anyway, but cool it's modern. Card. Even like it's modern. Like the question is, how much is modern still a thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. Modern somehow died before Legacy did. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's still around on Magic Online, and yeah. I don't want to talk about it. No, yeah, let's, 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 not, let's, <laughs> let's not. move on. Before we wrap up, I just want to mention one more card very quickly, because I do think this is like a, the wild card of the set. is Chandra's Incinerator. We were going to brush over it, but it's a uh, six mana, six, six elemental five and a red and this spell costs x less to cast where x is the total amount of non-combat damage dealt to your opponent's turn it's a six six trample then whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent chandra's incinerator deals that much damage to a creature or planeswalker that player controls so as i said this is a wild card you can do some cool things like suspend rift bolt and then like bolt them on your turn to make it cost cost one red mana or you can Turn two, sack both your lands to a fire blast with two floaty and cast it. Then it gets source of plowshares. <laughs> but joking, as- <laughs> joking aside, I think anything that has this like cost reduction with something that's quite easy to do, like bolting or chain lighting your opponent or price of progressing, has pretty high ceilings. So, yeah, this is my wild card, cool shot. My think- my instinct is that this is very much unplayable, but I do respect that cost reduction can make a lot of things playable yeah. someone's gonna like find a lightning axe for zero mana and it's broken <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean if it had haste i'd be down but yeah then it probably would be broken then would attack on two on turn two i guess yeah <laughs> I mean, trample is yeah. pretty relevant but mm-hmm. yeah honestly like i think it's just slightly worse than battle Bad- lamb reveler because battle reveler while it doesn't have the same claws it also kind of gets cheaper as you cast more spells and then it refills your hand, which I value a little bit higher than having a 6-6 six, six Trampler. Kind of. I think it's quite easy to just, to just, like, turn two, suspend Rift Bolt, Lava Spike your opponent, and cast this turn two. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that, that That's the scenario that actually makes it playable, right? I think yeah. all the other scenarios where it comes down on turn three, it's also already like, eh. I just don't yeah. think burn, like, can burn really afford to ever have dead cards. It's true. Like, Maybe this, this isn't is a burn such a heinous it's... top deck. Yeah, I guess it doesn't work in prowess because it's non-combat damage. So yeah, you guys are probably right. It's it's just one of these cards with a high ceiling. So we'll see. Yeah, we will see. Maybe that's actually the one that that like we're we're gonna look back and be like, oh yeah, my yeah. god, how it's did we ban- almost skip over this? We yeah. dodged a bullet. Like Caleb <laughs> actually got us to to not look stupid because we at least touched on it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. what we do. We touch on cards and then we we brush over them and who knows? Um, something I actually want to shout out as well. Uh, this Thursday, I don't know if I actually get to edit the cast by then. I hope so, but. In, in case I do, uh, tune in Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, Central European Summer Time, that, or 8 p.m. Perth Time. I'm doing a card reveal for Jumpstart together with an Australian oh. Magic website. And we got a couple of spoilers. Some of them, like, we can't exactly tell you what they are, but we can tell you that we posted them to the Elves Discord, the announcement. <laughs> so wow. there's, there's going to be some, some cards that are going to get revealed. And I've seen, maybe I've seen them. <laughs> and <laughs> there's one particular card that I'm actually quite excited about for Legacy. And if you if you want to see that, definitely join us on Sunday. It's I'm gonna put it in the show notes, and I'm also gonna like post about it all the time on Twitter at its twenty three. So definitely check that out if you like. Let's say decks that have synergies and. That's all I can say. Like I don't, I don't want to like overstep the bound. What a tease! Oh my god! Set. Do you like decks with synergies? That's a pretty wide range. But <laughs> Do you like cards. But it's that not gonna be like text? it's not gonna be like a lightning bolt or something. What, show and tell and Grizzlebrand. Does that count synergy? <laughs> the, yeah, that's the stupidest synergy in the it's world. It's an updated yeah. Grizzlebrand. <laughs> in speaking of Twitter. Um, I already mentioned if you want to find me that at it's Julian23. If you want to follow our cast, you can do it at EternalMTG. We always post what we're drinking before the cast. And by the way, I, I had some Spanish wine today. 
And I really gotta say, this is the best wine I've ever had while doing the podcast. And I'm wow. actually gonna drink more of that. I, remind me to buy the same thing again. You're more fun when you're drinking. Let's do it more. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. <laughs> but uh, I will take it. Yeah, I will take it. it. No, it is. Oh, that's okay. Where, where can people find you guys? I am at White Faces MTG on Twitter. It's the best place to find me. Posting stupid brews usually. And yeah. Wolf well, Control um, Decks. Yeah, um, sometimes that. I'm Gavin Lucky One on Twitter. Uh, also, same on Twitch on YouTube. Um, and I also have a, a Patreon for like exclusive Goblins content. The Callum has helped me a little bit. We did a video on Hogak. Um, I've got Cyborg Guides. Uh, Cybering with Goblins is really hard. So a lot of people love Cyborg Guides. Uh, and also have a monthly article series. So It's the single most requested feature on any content you ever do. Yes. You could run like the, 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 the Relentless Reds combo uh, Rentless Reds aggro deck people would be like how do you sideboard like well <laughs> here's my 20 page guide oh the, they uh, did it the people love sideboard guides yes, yes they do <laughs> rightfully so though that's, that's good reason to, to, to use them I, I heavily use them whenever I pick up a new deck and then after learning that I adjust but that I mean that's the best way to do it yep. uh, if you want to support what we are doing we also have a Patreon patreon.com slash everydayeternal you can sign up on a couple of different tiers to support the creation of this podcast and I'm just looking at the the clock. It says two hours and then something. Um, you can also support the editing process so I can buy more wine while I edit the podcast. So if you <laughs> want to support that, <laughs> sign up. Just like our, like uh, especially on our highest tiers, uh, the Eternal Witness tier, we have Matt Nams, Valerio, James Slack, and Victor Benanz. And if you want me to buy even better wine, you can sub- subscribe on the Grizzle Brand tier like Baju Butts, Scott Monroe, Kurdish Ali Stay, and Jeremy Gates. So... Thank you. Thank you so much for that. If you want to support us in other ways, you can go on iTunes. You can leave an, you, uh, I think we haven't had a new review on iTunes in, in quite a while. So if you want to be the next um, person to, to give us a shout out there and help other people find the podcast, yeah, just, just go there. And it actually does make quite the difference. So thank you for, so much for that. Thank you, Eli, for coming on. Uh, for you me. guys might have noticed Matt had to leave on a dental emergency. He lives on an island and he's basically the only doctor there. And... Apparently somebody somebody had issues with their teeth, so he had to leave. But he says hello, goodbye, have a great time, and see you again for the next cast. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone.